Welcome everyone. This is the June 5th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Um, we are continuing on from an executive session we had that started at 6 o'clock. Um, the first item of business is very exciting. We have a presentation um, of a scholarship award to a local student. Um, and someone is here from AMP to do that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Harry Phillips. Hi, good evening. Uh, Harry Phillips with AMP, Director of Marketing. And uh, you're right, I do have uh, uh, very exciting news here. Uh, one of uh, your students, graduating seniors, is the recipient of the uh, uh, Richard H. Gorsuch uh, Scholarship. And AMP gives out um, eight scholarships a year throughout the whole footprint of AMP, and that, uh, that includes 135 uh, member communities in nine states. And um, the Gorsuch, um, uh, like the uh, the right, there's four of each, is, is awarded uh, to a graduating senior from somebody who works within the uh, city, town, borough. Um, and the right uh, is actually available to any uh, uh, young person in the community who's graduating. So, and then there's actually sometimes that a couple of our communities will win both. But uh, this year, for sure, we, we're here for Yellow Springs, uh, for Tristan. And um, Tristan did uh, Created quite a great job here uh, in attaining the uh, the scholarship. Uh, as I said, uh, there's there's four scholarships for the Gorsuch. They're twenty five hundred dollars uh, each, uh, and to date uh, we've given out uh, over three hundred eight thousand uh, dollars since nineteen eighty eight for the scholarships. It's in memory of Richard H. Gorsuch, who's the late president of AMP, and. Um, as I said, uh, this is the awarded to uh, a young graduating student of somebody who works within the uh, city or community. There were 17 students nominated for the Gorsuch Scholarship. Uh, students had to write an essay about public, how, about public power. Uh, finalists then took a test about public power. And then the uh, AMP Board of Trustees uh, approved four recipients. And of course, that's why I'm here uh, this evening. A little bit about Tristan uh, Giardulo. Um, Tristan is the son of Dennis, uh, Denise Swinger and Joseph Girardulo. Denise is the planning and zoning administrator for the village. Tristan is a graduate of Yellow Springs High School. He is, he is currently enrolled in the Sinclair Community College uh, in the Unmanned Aerial Systems Program. He is working towards an applied, sci applied science degree. After Sinclair, Tristan would like to attend a four-year university to get a degree in geographical information systems. He was extremely involved in school and the community, and these are some of his highlights. <coughs> he was a member of the National Society of Leadership, uh, Academic Invite. Tristan volunteered for Four Paws for Ability, where he took a dog to visit a housebound senior citizen for a few hours a week. He also fostered a dog for six months to get him socialized for advanced training. These activities were part of Tristan's senior project. Tristan was a member of the track and field team, as well as the soccer team. His senior year, Tristan helped the varsity soccer team bring home a district win in the sweep, as the sweeper uh, slash defender. He also volunteered for many community activities and programs. We find Tristan to be a very talented uh, young man with a promising future, and on behalf of the uh, AMP Board of Trustees, I'd like to award him $2,500. Congratulations, Tristan. Congratulations. Congratulations, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> and Sis. <laughs> you can go now. You don't, I mean, you're welcome to stay, Tristan. I'm sure you want to, but um, that's great. And it's great that, that a community partner like, uh, like AMP um, is able to support our community like that. And we'll find out. We, Johnny, uh, um, Burns also has been uh, well supported thanks to his good work uh, with AMP. Um, any other announcements? Brian, I know you have some. Yeah, I'll mention a few things. Um, first of all, if everyone doesn't know, on June 15th, um, the Little Art Theater, 
Is it really? Yes, Happy it birthday. Is. All right. Um, it's Karen's birthday, and uh, <laughs> we are celebrating it at the Little Art Theater along with Andy Holyoke's uh, retirement party from 7 to 9. Uh, the public's invited. I know that we'll be showing um, Steve and Julia's um, The Last Reel and also sharing stories, so it's going to be a great time. Um, also, I wanted to make sure that people save the date for June 24th which is this year's uh, Yellow Springs Pride. Uh, always a very important uh, celebration <laughs> here in the village. And lastly, and this will segue into, I know Karen's got an announcement, um, this Saturday is the Strawberry Festival, which is at the uh, Presbyterian Church, and it's part of uh, a amazing event that we have on June 10th. Karen? Um, street Fair is Saturday. Um, <laughs> um, if anybody, I think, Alex is still looking for volunteers, so if anybody wants something to do at 6 o'clock Saturday morning, we could probably use. Actually, I think this is a time when we could use volunteers at the end of the day. So it would be, you could get your sleep and still come out and then head over to the music fest. So um, we still do need volunteers. Um, be patient. We're, we do everything we can to try to keep, um, I don't know if we can keep traffic down, but at least to keep it under control. Um, and. Um, we hope it will be a good day, and we know it's a great day for all of our merchants and, and vendors. And nonprofits. And nonprofits, especially, yes. Any other announcements? Nope. Okay. Um, moving on to the consent agenda, we have the minutes of May 15th and the minutes of May 16th special meeting. Can I get a uh, motion, please? I move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. A uh, review of the agenda. Um, is there anything? I believe, Marianne, did you want to add the a small I, discussion item? Um, I, I had a question about um, the minutes from the last meeting. Oh. Patty was going, uh, not, not to approve it. I mean, I approved the minutes. Oh, okay. But um, it noted that Patty was going to come back with some information about the Empower organization. Yes, and I have emailed him twice uh, asking for the references, and he has promised them to me both times, and I have yet to receive them. And I actually just wrote myself a note um, to email him yet again. Thank you. Um, the HRC report was supposed to be scheduled for this meeting. Steve McQueen didn't see it on the agenda, and so he's getting married the next time, but he's going to get another HRC person. Okay. To, so let's put it on for, for the 19th. the 19th. I'd also like to, for new business, like to say something about the Paris okay. Accord and the mayors, um, whatever that is, from the mayors, the United States mayors, supporting the Paris Accord. And uh, I'd also like to have a brief discussion about the housing needs update next step. Okay. So we'll put that under old business. Okay. And these would also be short discussions, but I think we need to add um, a brief discussion about the uh, second community communicate uh, conversation related to the CBE. I guess that's old business. And um, I'd like to briefly talk about our meeting related to the Complete Streets Workshop, which maybe is new business. Okay. Anything else? Um, Brian, would you review the petitions and communications? Yes, so we had um, our treasurer's report um, submitted from Rachel McKinley, um, highlighting some transfers of funds and whatnot, um, which was all uh, an effort to get a better return on the, the limited options that you have as a municipality for investing uh, your funds. Um, we also uh, received a letter from Don Johnson uh, highlighting that uh, we should table our decision about the um, uh, proposed Cresco medical marijuana plant. Um, also, Catherine Vander Heiden uh, highlighted that she thought that um, uh, this business would be great for the community and um, highlighted affordability. Um, Mary Stuckenberg, um, who's the executive director of the Community Children's Center, uh, wanted to thank the village for providing bike lights for the kids to keep them safe. Um, that was an initiative that we started a couple months ago. And, and um, Judy, maybe you can say something about where people can get lights now if they need them when you, I don't know, now or later? 
right about 10 feet from you right now because there are about 300 of them in my office. <laughs> but you can always get them at the police department at any time. And in fact, officers normally have them in their vehicles when they're driving around to give out in case they see you. And you're not highly visible, but you can always stop by dispatch, the dispatch window, or ask me or send me an email. We'll get you one. Thanks, they're, Judy. They're really nice colors, too. <laughs> um, we also had uh, a notice about the Five Rivers Green County Health Center, which is opening in Xenia. And uh, not only will they provide uh, medical services if you don't have a place to go, but they also will help uh, folks with applying for Medicaid if they do not have insurance. And finally, we had the uh, mayor's report for this month. Um, and one thing notable is that it did show an uptick in misdemeanors coming to the mayor's court. Um, I think a lot of people have followed that we've been, um, and actually Brian Carlson has been pushing for more active use of mayor's court, and so I think that does reflect that. And uh, Brian, when you do your report, maybe you could share the, the thank you note that you received um, by email. Um, so I'll let you do that. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, Next, we're moving into public hearings and legislation. We have the second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2017. Judith, we've, we've used, you've been asking that we move the, now that I just stopped, that we move the reports, the staff reports. Let's go ahead and do that. Um, since um, So we'll do the manager's report, the assistant village manager, um, the interim chief, and then the clerk's report. I, and I then think, we'll go to legislation. I think we've been doing those after legislation. Right after we legislation. Have? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. After legislation. Okay. Excuse Before me. Citizen. Okay. Um, okay. So second reading in public hearing 2017-11. Just by title? Yes. Okay. This is approving a conservation easement to the Tecumseh Land Preservation Association for a portion of the property known as the Glass Farm. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty? Uh, and I know Krista, I believe Krista's here, so. Yes, um, this, is the, uh, this is the easement we've been working on for quite a while um, around the wetland area uh, to go hand in hand with the Clean Ohio grant um, to restore um, some, of the, some of the area to its natural uh, habitat. Um, there is a 100 foot um, access on the north side of the property that is not included in this easement. Um, it does have an allowance for an unimproved or slightly improved, I believe, trail, and also for potential work on the culvert should we need to enlarge that at, at any future date. Um, Krista, did I miss anything? No. I think that's good. Uh, Brian raised a few questions at the last meeting that are addressed now, so it dispels things out a little bit more clearly. Any comment? Question from Council. This is the second reading. I will open the public hearing for comment from citizens. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to Council table. Judy, would you please call the vote? Yes. Hempfling. Hempfling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Leave us hanging. McQueen? Yes. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, the next piece of legislation is uh, long awaited. Um, it's nearly six months since uh, we had uh, the unfortunate incident um, New Year's Eve and um, our police chief resigned at that point and uh, a few months or a few weeks uh, later we did appoint an interim chief who's been serving um, until now and council has gone through a pretty deliberative process with staff, um, hearing from citizens, um, trying to decide how we were going forward, hearing also from the Justice System Task Force and other, um, other groups that have been working on this. And um, it was decided about a month or so ago that we would do an internal only process. Um, we did receive three uh, applications from um, folks within the police department. Um, and there have been, there's been a 
delivered a, a very good public process that unfortunately I wasn't able to be at, but it was, um, I know it was very well attended. I understand this room was quite full. Um, council had the opportunity to interview all three candidates individually, and um, Patty has, um, has contacted all of the council members since, and um, I'm pleased uh, that, that Patty has made a decision um, after consulting with a lot of folks, and I'd like to turn it over to Patty to make the announcement. Thank you. Um, as Karen noted, um, this was a long and involved process. I continued even over the weekend uh, getting input from any number of people um, as we traveled to Illinois and back on, on Friday. Um, I got numerous emails about all of the candidates. Um, I have made my decision and I am appointing Brian Carlson as permanent chief. And I would like to add that the other two candidates, which were Dave Meister and Tim Spradlin, both stellar candidates, both have wonderful attributes. I hope they see a bright future with this department because I see that for them. Um, and um, I'm sure that these guys are wonderful officers and that we can all move forward together. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Um, we do have um, a piece of legislation, right? Do we have a resolution um, that we need to, to pass? Or by title only. By title only. All right. Is or it, no, just read. Is it is it long? It's, mm, it's pretty yeah. long. Yeah, just by title only then. Sorry, I got to skip the part about how great you are, but <laughs> <laughs> resolution <laughs> resolution 2017-26 approving the hiring of Brian Carlson as chief of police. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> um, do we any anything additional to be said? Uh, no. That the I believe Judy is going to put the contract terms online tomorrow. Yes. Um, so those will be readily available to anyone who wants to see them. Um, uh, it will be effective as it of. It will be effective as of tomorrow morning uh, when I swear Brian in as the permanent chief and sign the contract. And we will have a more formal um, swearing in at the next council meeting on, on June 19th, um, where we, maybe somebody will want to take a picture, and I'm sure Shannon will want to, uh, want to be here. Um, so um, any other comments or questions from council? Well, I would just like to say from a, from a council standpoint, uh, yes, we've gone through some tough times beginning the end of the last year. But uh, as, as a council person, I, I, I have to commend the community. Uh, you folks did contact me with uh, good and bad. But the thing I liked the, the most about it is that in the end, I think the community has come together. And we're going to move forward in all areas of policing. And, and I think in the end, we will become a, uh, an example for small communities that big communities will then look at to see how well community policing can be, got, be, be done. And from myself, uh, this past week was, uh, from a health standpoint, was, uh, was very bad, but our police department were the first to be there to assist me and so forth and and I really thank them and, and I think it's it's due a lot also to the change in thinking on how we can as police officers can better ser serve the community so thanks to you guys I I just like to say that um I was so impressed with all three candidates, and in particular at the candidates meeting, uh, I thought it was probably the best search process we'd ever had. <laughs> Just looking inside of what we already have. Um, and um, while we hired Brian, um, 
Dave and Tim clearly have so much to offer this community and I'm so glad that they're on our department and really want to take advantage of their skills as well as all the skills of the people in the police department. Great. Um, yeah, I, I want to uh, thank Brian for what he's done for our community since January 1, um, the healing that he's brought. And I think uh, that he's um, been able to help the, the whole police department. It feels like it's coming together. I think that's very important. We've had a history of division in our department, which has not been a, a healthy thing. And so I'm very pleased the leadership that Brian is showing uh, to, to really appreciate the police officers, have a really strong sense of what the community wants. And I think, you know, other police officers have, you know, know that as well because they're part of our community as well, particularly uh, Dave Meister. Um, so I'm feeling, you know, very encouraged that we can move forward, you know, building this progressive, uh, compassionate uh, department that, ser that provides the service to our community that, that we want. And so thanks to Brian and all the police department, Dave Meister and uh, Tim Spratlin as well. Great. Yeah, actually I do want to say something. So uh, first of all, I want to underscore uh, what Marianne said and, and Judith also alluded to. Um, and I expect that Brian will be looking at ways to uh, effectively utilize Dave and Tim because uh, they do have some amazing skills. And, and again, we were all really impressed with just who we have on our force uh, and, and the expertise. Um, but I also want to say, Brian, keep up the good work. Uh, continue to be brave about being innovative and, as Judah said, progressive. And I think you know, but I want to again say that you have council and the village manager manager's full support. Um, so thank you. Everybody else said it so well, there's no reason for me to repeat, but I, congratulations, Brian. We're lucky to have you on board, and um, your first week on duty, you've got a big, a big event. So <laughs> I know you'll be busy Saturday. So. What's going on? <laughs> oh, <Oops. yeah. laughs> um, Did we take a vote? I don't you know if we, we haven't not. taken a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, one additional change I do want to make to the agenda, down under old business, we've got proposed medical marijuana facility update. We're just going to move that up into the next piece of legislation um, because it doesn't quite seem right to be passing a piece of legislation before we've had a discussion about the update. So um, that's actually what we're going to do first. Judy's actually going to bring uh, a presentation up. We'll actually be able to see some pictures. Um, just a brief review for folks that may not be aware. Um, I guess it's been about a month ago now. Um, we were contacted by a company by the name of Cresco, um, who is a company that has Cresco Labs, who have um, three medical marijuana facilities in Illinois, who actually happened to pass the law a little bit sooner than Ohio did. Um, they established those three plants um, in Joliet, Illinois, Lincoln, and Kankakee. And um, so we've gone, it was a very quick process. I'll, there's a little bit in this presentation talking about a timeline, but they have until, um, they are looking for a location for cultivation and processing facility. Uh, the way the state of Ohio has set up the laws, um, they, they are regulating it in stages. And they just introduced the regulations a few weeks ago at about the time we were contacted for the cultivation process and to the, the, the license, the process to go through to get a license. But those applications need to be in by June 30th, which means that um, they had a very short time frame and we have a very short window in which to to respond because they need to have a commitment um, certainly prior to that June 30th date because the state of Ohio is requiring that they have um, a, a site selected that has proper zoning that they have control of 
so that they, they would have title to if this deal goes through. So it all has to move forward very quickly. Um, not comfortable for us on council necessarily and certainly not comfortable for the community. We recognize that um, we're not a community that makes decisions quickly. Um, and, and, you know, it, and we require, and this is, it, this is something new. So we recognize that this was going to require a great deal of deliberation. We've done, um, we've done a lot of it. Um, we've done a lot of due diligence. Um, the Cresco folks came to town last uh, Monday and Tuesday. Um, Chris Shrimp, who is the uh, local rep from Columbus, is actually here tonight. Um, we spent two days, they spent two days here meeting with stakeholders, um, meeting and, and there were stakeholder meetings all day Monday and half of the day Tuesday um, and then we had a special meeting on on uh, Tuesday and we were able to uh, to bring uh, Charlie Bactel who is um, the principal and Chris in to make a presentation to um, to council and to the community that was there we recognize it was very short notice um, but it was it was as much as we could do it was quick it was as quick as we could possibly respond um, since that time um, there have been many more conversations between staff um, Chris Connard our legal counsel has uh, been in consultation with their legal counsel on Friday um, Brian uh Patty, Denise Swinger, our zoning and, and planning uh, person, and myself went to Illinois and visited two of their factories. Um, we were we were really pretty blown away by it. Um, it was amazing facility, amazing people. I kind of want to just go through quickly. Um, this is their presentation. I am not going to do their presentation. I left a few slides in. Most of the slides I want you to see are slides that, that we added with local information. This is just showing the kind of projections of what they're expecting um, sales of medical marijuana to do over, um, over the next few years, basically showing that, they're, that the, the existence of a robust market. Next, Judy. Um, this shows the states that have passed either um, recreational and medic or medicinal uh, marijuana laws. So there's a lot of states in the middle that haven't, um, and it's pretty much as usual how, how things happen. The coasts um, tend to lead the way in these things. Um, but Ohio is certainly not the first, and, and there are more states joining in. Next. Um, this, these are pretty pictures. This is this is part of their part of their presentation, kind of um, showing some of their product um, product things and and how they package. I want to go on to show you more of their facility. So unfortunately, we're not seeing all of everything. So the facility on top is their. Um, uh, is there a Lincoln facility, which is closer to um, the kind of facility that will be would be in Yellow Springs? If you um, the building on the front is with the brown roof is the office and production area, which is in this situation it's it's a metal building like the rest of it, but it could be conventional construction. That's an L shape um, that is pretty standard that contains their offices and also all of their lab and, and production facilities. The two buildings next to it to the right are what they call um, modern hybrid greenhouses. And and there I'll show you we have a the next slide and, and down below, which the, the picture we can't see, one of their other facilities that we went to in Joliet is a tilt slab building, a concrete building. It is truly conventional construction there, you can see it. So it's a little bit more conventional in terms of, of an office building. Um, Judy, next. So this is the inside of one of the hybrid um, greenhouses. Um, you can see this is, this is essentially the exact footprint of that we would be getting for taking going through the cultivation process um, and they they I think are initially talking about doing two or three bays they move the plants as the plants mature from one day to the next um, you can see you can see a lot of light coming in through that um, through that roof through that greenhouse roof system it's a translucent roof um, 
you can't really see very well, but but they're using these kind of state-of-the-art agriculture agricultural um, racking systems. The way they water, they're actually watering directly into the plants, so there's very little um, waste. I, I don't think I saw any water on the floor anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so so there isn't runoff. There isn't a lot of water. They aren't just you know blanket spraying anything. Um, very they're they're very environmentally um, and and um, resource sensitive. Next one, Judy. So how do, so if you go back to the next one, go back to the last one. Okay, so so what this is showing is is the the roof structure. This is showing the the uh, curtain structure that crosses over to to co cover up. So you can go ahead and move move forward. So this shows that there, each one of those bays, those, those translucent bays on the roof, has one of these black curtains. That's the first one that closes. And the, the black on the right is actually what it looks like. That's the curtain closed fully. But then once that curtain is closed, then the white curtain below it comes across and takes out all of the light, 100% of the light. So. The, the reason that this is important to us is because it reduces, there were concerns about light pollution at night. This will eliminate um, any concern about light pollution at night. Next. Um, there's been a concern expressed about odor and odor control, and this is part of the fan and um, exhaust and scrubbing system that they use to remove, um, to kind of capture and remove the odors. Um, I will say that until we got in the facility, I didn't smell anything. Um, and it, literally, the doors had to open before we could smell anything. I didn't personally smell anything until we actually got into production um, myself. So um, that really didn't seem to be a an issue. Um, next, Judy. Um, this is showing some of the uh, cultivation. This actually happens to be um, Joliet, not Lincoln. Um, this gentleman is amazing. Um, he is, he knows agriculture, he knows um, biology, botany, he's hybrid, you know, they're creating hybrids. And, and, and um, the way the process that they go through to um, to cultivate and develop new species and new strains of cannabis is amazing and, and they're going to the point where where they're able to target particular um, strains to particular ailments and, partic and that the uh, that the healing properties um, they're really targeting it on how, on on particular strains that work for particular issues. Next. Um, this is showing a little bit more of the, of the techie part of it. This is on the, the left, the picture is the, um, the extraction where they're actually extracting the, um, what are they, they're extracting Cannibal the oils plants. The, 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 from the plant. And then on the right is, it's part of the cooking process. This is just to kind of produce a wax. There are any number, and I'm not going to get into to all of the different products that they use, but one of them is a wax, and this oven um, helps to produce that wax. And, and this shows the kind of the three brands that they have. Um, Cresco, which is, um, focused on THC based products, Remedy which is a little bit more um, related, it, it's in, in what they... CBD. CBD is, is a, a, a different strain, a different part of the, of the uh, cannabis plant. And then Mindy's is their edibles and they've actually hired a chef from Chicago to develop recipes um, to, to, for the candies and, and other edibles that they, that they produce. And we tested some of the they were good. non medicated ones. <laughs> and they were excellent. They, they were. Yeah, uh, CBD, uh, which is something that, you know, in this education process that we've learned is, is uh, very different from THC. It directly helps with pain, but it doesn't have, as, as they put it, the euphoric feeling. And so, in sort of looking at their product lines, they think about. Um, you know, who would be comfortable with using cannabis, who would not be comfortable with it, but would still get those benefits. So they have a variety of different products, and as Karen said, that really target those different issues. 
Um, I'm not going to say much about this, but but they are but they're very big on on education. So one of the things that they do is physician education, because I mean it, it's, in Ohio we're going to have to go through a big educational process because um, it's going to be totally new to our physicians. It's going to be confusing. So they will go through an education process with physicians. It isn't prescribed. Ohio doesn't allow prescriptions. It's it's you need to get a doctor's recommendation first. You get a are, are they doing the cards? Chris, yes. are they doing the cards? Okay. We are. So, so patients need to uh, go through a process th through the state to get a card to allow them um, to purchase, but then they also have to go to a physician, and a physician will, will certify that they have whatever condition um, is required to receive, to, to be able to, to uh, go purchase the, the cannabis. Next. Um, I, I was really impressed. As somebody that's into marketing, I was I was impressed with with their with their marketing approach. Um, very consumer friendly. Um, they um, and I can't read the the what were the three um, the right. There was revive remedy and um, relax. Relax. Rest, right. Rest, 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 relax. So it's basically the three the three different the three different kinds of chemicals um, how how your body reacts to it and and and, and, and how exactly folks like to consume um, the cannabis kind of depends upon um, they can go to one of those three uh, products next. Um, so this is kind of in this these I did not realize how small these slides were now I understand when I people put together PowerPoints <laughs> that I can't read and I um, Oops, well, sorry. this is we did make this available on right. the website. This, this will be available tomorrow on the website. The this kind of shows the the numbers. So there's 11.6 million people in, in the state of Ohio. They are expecting about a thou, about one percent or 116,000 um, patients um, will be um, uh, using cannabis by 2021, and um, Based upon their their market share in Illinois, which is actually quite high, their their market share in Illinois is I think 15 percent or 22%. more. 22 percent. They're they're you know being very conservative here in Ohio, and they're they're hoping that they'll get 8 percent. Um, if they continue in Ohio as they've been doing in Illinois, I would expect it would be greater than that. Would you pull it up a little bit, Judy? And then on the bottom again, you can't you're not going to be able to read this, but this is showing a little bit of the timetable. I already said that that. Their applications are due to the state on June 30th. Um, they expect to hear whether they're successful by um, September or October of this year. As soon as they hear um, if they've received a license, they plan on breaking ground and starting construction. And then everything is supposed to be up and running by September of 2018. So people, by, by September 8th of 2018, uh, patients should be able to go into a dispensary and actually purchase cannabis. Next. So this you're never going to be able to read. So I have our professional uh, person here that is going to be able, our finance director who's going to be able to kind of review these numbers. This is basically showing the local impact. So I've, we've got up there the, the, um, the local tax, income tax. So, so the number, the ways we have to benefit, I'll go through and then Melissa can get into the specifics. So we have an income tax um, impact, we have a property tax impact, um, those are the direct financial. Um, Cresco as a, as a company has pledged to a 2% um, profit sharing with the community. That could come either in the form of funds directly to a uh, it, to a community government or shared um, with nonprofits. How that happens, we're not sure. We don't know the legalities of how that can be distributed and whether it's something that the village can actually receive directly. But it's a commitment that uh, Cresco has made to support our nonprofits. Um, they've also pledged to um, work with. Um, uh, They've also pledged to work with, um, to, to allow their employees to work with um, local nonprofits 
40 hours a week or 40 hours in a quarter per employee. So that's incredibly generous. Um, they've already started some other partnerships, which we'll talk about later. So Melissa, why don't you talk about the numbers? So uh, the first number is income tax potential. We had some um, estimations by Cresco. They gave us an estimation of an annual payroll of 2.5 million total. And at the Yellow Springs uh, Municipal income tax rate of 1.5%, the withholding portion would be approximately 37,500. Um, there would be um, additional net profits that could be dispersed to the village um, depending on how the, the business does. And we don't have any kind of estimations with that um, we just had the payroll um, withholding information and then the second piece of that would be the property tax potential um, the number that was used that would be invested I think was 6.3 million in the facility that would not all be um, what the property is valued at so I have two different um, scenarios here just for comparison's sake on um, the top is a six million dollar property value and the bottom is a four million dollar property value um, in both cases, um, the top, the, the higher estimation, the village would uh, receive approximately $23,000 worth of um, property taxes based on that $6 million valuation. And then on based on a $4 million property value, the village um, as a municipality would receive $15,000 approximately. Um, so this also gives the breakdown of what all of the other uh, stakeholders would receive, including the county, the township, the schools, career Did center. Did you mention the schools? Yeah, the schools um, based on the $6 million property valuation are about $94,000. Um, and then uh, based on the lower valuation at four million um, would be approximately 63,000. And we do expect that, that they'll probably, they're, they're still trying to decide if they're going to, to um, chances are they're not gonna build out the full facility. They'll, they'll build it in such a way that they can add bays, but there's a minimum 25,000 square feet that they'll start out with. That's what's required of the, uh, of the um, type uh, one or uh, tier one, tier one um, licensee. So 25,000 square feet of cultivation space. They're looking at potentially about a 50,000 square foot facility, and they're looking at a, a total of inve total investment of about um, at the end with equipment, with all of the the consulting, all of the services, everything, all of the license fees of somewhere in the range of 11 million dollars that they're going to be making in Ohio in this facility. And the infrastructure. And the infrastructure, right? Um, so, um, and I can't read what any of. The, can you go on to the next one? Indeed. So. Um, they are about community. Um, they're about community outreach, um, and not only just with with generosity, but they they're already looking at community partnerships. They've already reached out to EnviroFlight and have taken some of EnviroFlight's um, fertilizer. They've already been talking to Community Solutions about doing some taking um, using their compost, so all of their waste that's. Um, they, they compost and it can be used anywhere and, and they're talking about utilizing that at Agraria and there's also some soil amendment work um, that, and research that Agraria is doing that they're involved with. Um, they also do research here in Illinois or in Illinois they're doing research with a lot of the universities. We have a medical uh, school here in, in Fairborn, I can see some, some very um, good potential research being done there also. Is there another one? Well, and I think what's amazing about this is they have started working with these organizations since they started talking to us. So within about a week, they followed up on these opportunities. Uh, we were blown away when we were there to see EnviroFlight's fertilizer in the factory. And to hear, I mean, it was it was pretty impressive. Is there another one, Judy? There's that it? That's it. Okay, so that's it. So um, there was a lot there. Um, Chris, I don't know if you want to add anything. Um, Chris Shrimp. Chris Shrimp, well, not you. Clarification I would is on the property bill. Why don't you? The property bill out will be the, that first that first part will be six million dollars, and then by 2021. It will be more than six million if we hit the patient projections because we will build out the rest of the of the building with the revenue that's coming in. So the initial six, investment itself is the six million. Is, is six million that only gets you to the fifty thousand square foot, 
when we get to the hundred thousand square foot, the investment will be much larger. Okay. So, I assume we've got questions, council questions. I, I wondered if it's worth uh, you letting the citizens know what we're voting on tonight in conjunction with this uh, information also. So, Chris Connard, could you talk about that? Uh, good evening. Uh, all right, so the process that we're going forward with is that there's a, a before council tonight uh, a resolution uh, to discuss uh, that would allow Patty to uh, enter into an option agreement uh, that has a contingency of Cresco uh, being approved for the licenses that they are going to be applying for. Uh, if Cresco receives those licenses from the state, uh, then uh, council would be authorizing what Council is authorizing Patty to sign a purchase uh, option agreement for the eight acres of land. Um, then, depending on how this plays out, uh, Council will then need to move forward with an ordinance to approve the actual sale of the land. Um, we had a conference call on Thursday morning. I received a draft of a uh, purchase option agreement Saturday afternoon at 1.30. We're working through that document now. and. Uh, I uh, expect that it will be ready later this week. Okay. So I, I do, would want to add this one piece. <clears throat> because of this timeline that has been dictated by the state, um, and really uh, we're all at the mercy of what the state uh, has done, uh, it is possible that uh, there may be uh, a discussion of whether or not to add an agenda item to next council meeting. Uh, on an or potential ordinance uh, to actually authorize the sale of the land if the um, contingency of obtaining the licenses by Cresco were met. We don't know about that yet, but I just wanted to let council know and let the citizens know that, that may be something that will be, they'll see on the agenda. So I don't okay. surprises. Okay. Um, and I do believe um, there is another trip planned for additional staff members. On the 16th. The yes. 16th, that'll be Marianne. Jerry, are you? Marianne, Jerry, Johnny, um, Jason, not Jason, Johnny and Matt and Brad? Not Melissa. Brad either. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so there will be four more going out. It's a long day, I will tell you. It's a long day. Five thirty in the morning till ten thirty at night. So um, but it's well worth it. So um, citizen questions, comments. Come on. <laughs> You must come for some reason. <laughs> Deborah McGee, resident. And I have a couple of concerns about it. I know you mentioned the Enviro flight use of the fertilizer. And in general, is it organic? Would they be leaving a lot of chemicals on the land? No. That was, they're, uh, they're, it's because of the fact that people are ingesting it. It's they, um, what's the word, the term that they use? Um, oh, the uh, beneficial bugs? Ben beneficial bugs. They're, it's very low um, uh, pest. There's a point at which, or, or very low fertilizer. I don't know if they use any fertilizer. It's Right. Yeah. So um, Illinois has incredibly restrictive um, uh, laws or regulations about pesticides, and Cresco has agreed to apply those same standards here. Um, so basically when it comes to you know anything that they put on the plants, it's before they flower and they use things like cinnamon oil. So we're talking about very minimal impact um, and almost no runoff because their system they use uh, you know the sort of drip watering so that they give the plants exactly how much water they'll absorb. So, uh, to, so, and um, that is also, um, Charlie Bactel gave a pretty uh, specific presentation about that at the last meeting, which we have videoed. Um, but yeah, they've guaranteed that. And my other concern is about safety for the workers, mm -hmm. potential robbery. Is this where they're going to have a lot of product that could be sold on the black market with mm -hmm. this Taxar police force? Yeah, is there the, a potential? That's, I'm, I'm sure Illinois dealt with that, but that. Yeah, that's let's, good. let's. Um, We'll take your question. We'll answer. We'll, I'll see if there's a lot. We'll definitely answer that. When Brian's already answered, we'll definitely answer that question. And I want we'll to say see if general, other people. Uh, I support the idea of medical marijuana because I think it's so great that people wouldn't be smoking it. That's really hard on the lungs and the heart, and also it wouldn't be as illegal 
the people that would be using illegal means to get it now. So in general, I support the idea of medical marijuana. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Paul. You do. Paul D. Laverne, I've been here for about 50 years. Um, first, as a citizen, we've, I've heard pros and cons around town about this. We have to be very clear. This is not recreational marijuana in any form. No one's going to be stealing it, selling it on the black market. This is about a company that wants to come to our town, invest millions of dollars. They're going to pay for the road. They're going to pay for all the infrastructure, my understanding, and make it tappable to the other expansion of that property. Put a lot of money into the town. It will build. That's just those little charts and graphs are beginning of billions and billions of dollars. And it's not illegal. Speaking as a potential patient, in 25 states, I would have a prescription from an ophthalmologist for interocular pressure due to the rubber belts I have sewed around my eyes for 25 years. I'm blind totally in one eye and partially in the other. I don't have vitreous like the rest of you. They sucked it out, my eyes full of water from my body. So interocular pressure, I barely am maintaining what I've got left. Smoking pot every day for 47 years has kept me from the glaucoma my father had and my brother had. That's a genetic marker. And I talked to all of my ophthalmologists just like that. I'm a pothead. That's recreational. 25 years, it's been totally medical to keep me, not totally, the relaxation. <laughs> I'm honest. This is a you no know the fault for this town. This town <laughs> Now, do I agree with some of the people? Oh, I wish we could be like Colorado. I should be able to grow it freely in my backyard cheaply. But this isn't the trade. What we've got in Ohio is this. And if we can get it here, it's a win-win. And a lot of people I know who are now holding off cancer, literally curing cancer. I've got a friend from Antioch that graduated in 80. She was on fourth stage, told her to go home and die. Beth Gladstein. Her last she went off after chemo, after hair falling out, after all the drugs and trials. She went to using a little bit of oil every day. Her last two scans, zero. Tumors went away. She is now free. And they gave her four stage womanly go home and die. And that's what happened. This is a woman I know. She went to school here. These are the people that deserve what we want. This isn't about the kids smoking dope at the high school or going to the woods. This is about being honest adults and looking at science and seeing that we have a way to break ice in this whole state and make some damn money that we need. We don't have Vernays anymore. We don't have anybody. Thank you, Cresco, coming here. And I think you ought to vote on it totally. It's not about recreation. It's about medicine for the masses. I'm all for these people. Thanks, Paul. Anyone else? Chrissy? Oh, Dorothy, Chrissy's. Sorry, Ash. I'm Chrissy Cruz, and I just want to say once again, thank you. I think this is an excellent idea, and I feel like this is a perfect fit for our community. Um, one thing that really caught my attention in the news the last few years was reading about numerous people who had children who have seizures. And the only thing that controlled these children's seizures was CBD oil or THC oil and it dramatically improved their life just by having this oil. There were children that were, I've read about children who had like 20 to 30 seizures a day. Their brains were literally being damaged and they were taking all these pharmaceutical medications that were not controlling their seizures and then they put them on this medicinal cannabis and all of a sudden they're not having seizures anymore and they're able to live real lives again. And I'm really excited to see that Yellow Springs is going to be part of that. First of all, like I said a couple of years back in council meeting, with the reputation Yellow Springs has, it would be almost an embarrassment if we weren't one of the first places <laughs> to jump on this bandwagon. And so I also want to commend council because I know that you've taken some slack from people about saying that you're rushing in too quickly. I don't think so. I think time is of the essence, and I appreciate that you've jumped on this opportunity and that you're bringing this forward into our community and making it happen. I think it's going to be a great thing, and thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Thanks. Dorothy? Hi, my name is Dorothy Bouquet. 
Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, we don't mind taking more tax, tax income from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question is more about the CBE land. Uh, this week there's been lots of discussions about uh, building a new high school, and I was wondering if having Cresco on that land would disqualify the school district from looking at AUM uh, as a potential so what, uh, for school. Oh, we're waiting to answer that? Okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll answer it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, uh, I, I see all the many advantages of this company moving to Yellow Springs and it is very exciting and I, I see it could be very, very good for this community. I'm just wondering if they have some kind of um, a stand on full legalization of uh, marijuana and um, <clears throat> I wonder if they project full legalization as being a disadvantage to their business or if they see it as being an advantage to their business. I feel that if they feel, I mean, it may be hard to get a, 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 a candid statement from this company about how they view that, uh, but I think it would be a shame for this community if we supported a company that was against fully, full legalization for the, per, for the reason being as they feel that they would lose market share. It, it would be, we would be in conflict, I believe, if that was so. Yeah, I just wonder what their stand is. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. And your name, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Christine Roberts. Thank and thank you. you very much, Council. I applaud your work on this. Thanks. Anyone else? So I'll take a couple. I, I'm going to actually ask Chief to deal with a safety question. Do you, um, one of the stakeholder groups that we did, we met with Chief, um, Green County Sheriff Gene Fisher, and the major from the Green County Sheriff's Department. So they were apprised. We did have input from law enforcement. Um, Chief, do you have anything that you wanted to add? I You're still going to have to come up. Sorry. <laughs> Brian Carlson. <laughs> uh, I can just say, Gene Fisher, we were, uh, we were all impressed with the level of security that the facility offers. Uh, it's a very tight professional operation um, from light control, the odor emissions with charcoal or carbon filtration to uh, the security systems in place. The employees are in different color uniforms. Um, there's different clearance levels. Um, speaking as someone who's worked on the Air Force Base for years, um, it was uh, bar none as secure as any place I've been. So we were real impressed with that, and Gene had no questions himself. Thank you. And, and we saw it firsthand. Right. Yeah. So um, they have three plants in Illinois. Um, I think some people heard that they got, they applied for three licenses and were first, second, third. So they built all three plants. Um, and so they have not had any issues with robbery or any other um, um, crime issues since they've uh, started their operations. And um, what did they call the, the doors? Well, man they traps. call them man traps, yeah. people traps. Let's there you go. I know. Traps. Yeah, I didn't want to say. Um, but uh, you cannot get through one door until another door has been closed. So, you know, they've got cameras everywhere um, running nonstop. And, and they so. bring the truck in. So so it, it they have a van, um, unmarked van, that, that material goes off and the completed, the completed product leaves. It comes into the locked facility. So it comes in the garage door. They lock the garage door. The person who's driving the van can't get into the safes where the where the um, cannabis is is held. It, it's not until it gets to the dispensary that somebody gets a code that they can then enter in to get the product. So they really they really you know create a safe environment, um, and and they are very anxious you know to work with us. To, to soften, I mean, there's gonna, there there is a, a security fence, but they're they're um, more than willing to work with us to soften the appearance of that to make it look, look less obtrusive. Where it is looking to be sited at the CBE is in the far back corner, so it's very it's really barely going to be visible anyway. Um, so um, I, I think we can with with some plantings, and they don't want to be they don't want to be advertising themselves to the public either. Um, 
We also um, met with um, an elected official at the plant in Lincoln, and he highlighted, um, it, and this was the five county um, intergovernmental agreement, and he highlighted again, not only safe, but that they required um, the feed for the cameras to go to the state police office. and. Cresco will accommodate that. So again, I think that meeting with Brian and, and um, the sheriff's office was, was really important. Um, I can answer Dorothy's question. Uh, so the, the way the law reads is that um, uh, you have to put a, one of these facilities 500 feet uh, away from a church, a K through 12 school, uh, a public park. Um, however, once the plant is established, they grandfather in any new uh, organizations of that sort. So um, if the Cresco plant was built, uh, after that, a K through 12 school could move into AUM or it could become a church or whatever. Um, so that's how the law is set up in Ohio. And I do want to say that, that uh, we've, we've met um, and talked with, with school officials and there's a lot of support there. They, see they hear the numbers they they had already done their run their own numbers and when they see that kind of number coming to the schools recognizing that that's money that's going to that they're not going to have to come back and ask the community for um, they're very supportive of that um, let's see um, I'm gonna I was actually going to make a comment about the medicinal quality of the product and you know kind of following up on what Paul said that um, this isn't recreational this is medicinal marijuana um, I'm actually going to ask Chris um, if he went, wants to comment on the le legalization piece but this is my impression from what I saw is that these folks are creating the gold standard for medicinal marijuana they're creating strains that are for particular afflictions. It's not buying pot and smoking a joint. It's not recreational. So I think that they're creating a product for which there will continue to be a market even if marijuana is legalized for recreational use. Chris, do you want to take I, that further? I don't know. I think that's correct. We're, we're a medicinal uh, cannabis company. The recreational side is not something that we have really considered. Um, what we're doing is we're approaching the state as, as the law is now. Um, and I would say if you, if you were interested in recreational uh, in the future, the best thing for you would be a robust medical program that works in Ohio. So. Karen, okay. Karen, do you want to um, just uh, review the, the infrastructure, the question of who's paying for the infrastructure just to... Patty, I'm going to turn that over to Patty. Um, Cresco has committed to paying for the infrastructure. Um, however, I have been in contact with uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation because they do have grant money for roads that lead directly to um, job creation. So we may be able to get some grant money from ODOT. They also steered me to a similar pot of money with the Dayton Development Coalition, so we may be able to come up with some grant funding as a village to go towards the road, um, but Cresco has committed to paying for the infrastructure. Any other questions, comments? Um, I just wanted to comment. We've gotten a couple of uh, uh, comments from citizens that this is something citizens should vote on because it's you know, the village, uh, the community owns the land. And um, I just uh, want to respond to that. I, I mean, I don't agree with it. I think that uh, that we're, uh, we're elected to make these kind of decisions. Now there's times when citizens take it into their own hands and they have a referendum and and they decide but clearly in this instance if we would decide we were going to have the citizens decide we've just decided not to do this because there is not time mm -hmm. you know one of the negative sides of how quickly this has to be decided is that we don't have that much time and we don't get to decide we're going to take more time because that's that's not our an option so um, uh, and I'm I very much uh, support this going forward with this so seeing and hearing no comments well, there, was, there was one more oh I'm sorry I, I do have a can question. you come up um, I'm just curious. state your name please oh, sorry. Marie Miller um, I do have a question 
Do you actually go into the schools and educate them on your facility at all or provide any kind of counseling or drug counseling to students? So that's part of the conversation we have with the community and we've talked to the school board twice now. We had our second call with them today and if that is something they would want from us, we'd absolutely do it. If they want us to not be visible, we would you know, it's kind of up to what the school board and have, what the community Have you done prefers. anything in other we, states? We have not. I mean, we, our facilities in Illinois, um, as the council uh, attests to, are pretty, you know, pretty far out there. Um, that would not really near any schools or, you know, in a densely populated area like Hill Springs. I think what I would say is that is that this is going to be a, a new experience for Cresco. There, I, the impression I have of their facilities in Illinois is that the communities welcome them. They're, they're partners in the community, but it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. The communities are happy with the revenue, but they don't necessarily see a partnership. We're already seeing the potential for partnerships. I mean, the community is already embracing this. The fact that they're talking to community solutions, they're talking to EnviroFlight, they're putting forth the community partnerships. We're embracing that instead of being embarrassed by it or, or wanting, you know, wanting a hands-off approach. So I'm already excited by the opportunities. We did talk earlier, council, about, um, I talked with a couple of council members about the possibility of, of maybe doing some enhanced um, education, drug education. I know that that's something that, that, that Cresco would support. Um, they are, um, they're willing to put together a group to, to, to talk about drug drug addiction and, and you know not that this medical marijuana has anything to do with drug addiction but if there's any concern about mixed messaging we want to make sure the students are getting the right message so that's definitely something that that we're thinking about and I know the schools will think about and we also talked to the educational service center about it and they're also interested in that too so we're ready to take a vote I, I would just like to first just say, say what? You have to read it first. We have to read it. We haven't read it. Oh, that's right. Say something. Even, yes, please. Okay. Um, I, I sent out an email to random about 250 people, a pretty diverse group, I think. And I've now heard from probably about 90 people. And um, so this is just sort of, a, in a way, sort of a straw vote. 70, 75% of the people supported this. Um, I think there were three or four people that didn't and those who didn't say yay or nay had a number of questions which I tallied up and we've been working on getting the answers to them. So my sense is that there's pretty strong support in the community for it. And one of the brands that Yellow Springs is in the process of taking on or has taken on I think is being a health and wellness community. And I can see a way that this facility fits into that. Uh, there are going to be things that come out of having this here, assuming we do, the, that will benefit us. And there are some things that we don't know what the result will be. But I think that we have the capacity to address any concerns that we have. And the concern about um, drug education is something that I started thinking about when I had a conversation last evening uh, with some people. And uh, after we left the drug task force, we didn't really have any kind of program on drug education. Uh, and so I think this is a good opportunity. We will be getting some additional income one way or another. And I think that as a, as a complement to this facility, I would like to see us uh, establish a really premium drug education, drug abuse program that can go into the schools and be available for the citizens. Because clearly drug abuse, and I'm not saying it's not about medical marijuana. Uh, frequently, in fact, medical marijuana is used to support people who are trying to get off of abuse of drugs. But still, drug abuse is a critical issue. And if we can get funded some kind of program that can really impact especially young people, I think that would be really cool. Right. Great. So I just realized I've just been talking and we have we really don't have the resolution before us. So um, Judy, would you read resolution 2017-27 in by title only? Sure. This is authorizing the village manager to enter into an option agreement for the sale of eight acres of real estate. 
Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, so we've just kind of exhausted the talk about this. Um, the one last thing I want to say, Marianne talked about the wellness piece of the community. Um, I, I just see this fitting into so many of our wheelhouses. It's, you know, the, I always envisioned some kind of an agricultural, agriculturally based facility right there around next to the property that we want to remain as agriculture and that we hope through um, protection will stay as agriculture. So I can't think of anything better. Maybe we'll even get a special edible out of it too. Maybe we'll get, you know, our own Yellow Springs edible. Who knows? <laughs> so we've got the food, we've got the we've got the wellness and we've got the and we've got the manufacturing. And these guys are, are really, like I said, very cutting edge. So um, any other comments? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, and last, we have, and how did I lose my agenda? Um, what's the next one? Appointing the zoning in 2017-28. Did you read that by title only? Um, it's appointing the zoning administrator to the Architectural Review Committee. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Patty, you have to explain this one. The um, covenants on the property formerly known as the CVE um, have a provision for an architectural review uh, committee. Um, that committee is made up of, I believe, and Chris, you've worked on this probably a little more than I have, is made up of property owners and uh, someone appointed by the village. and. Um, in this instance, um, we choose to appoint Denise Swinger, um, who is our planning and zoning inspector, to be a member of the Architectural Review Committee um, for anything that's developed on that property. It makes sense because she has to review it anyway. She has to have a detailed review, a site plan review. It simply makes sense to allow her to also serve as our um, person, uh, our representative on the Architectural Review Committee. Okay. Chris the is... The board is made up of one person pursuant to the covenant right now. Pursuant to the covenant right now? Okay, because I know that did change. Well, because we own all that land. Okay. Right, it had been a combination of, of property owners. Wasn't that the way it was originally? Mm -hmm. Well, it was, it's intended. To... <clears throat> I, the Architectural Review Committee was intended to be made up of the various property owners. Since the land hasn't been developed, the village now acquired title to the property. Uh, there would be one member of the Architectural Review Committee, and given the development, it would make sense to have that person be the zoning administrator. Not AUM? Pardon me? Not AUM? If, they, if there's an objection. If there's an objection. Yes. Okay. Um, any comments or questions? From yeah. How, how much power does this person have? I mean, can they say yay or nay at whim or what? Chris, would you? I'm kind of totally up. And while you're up there, is, that, is there such a committee? It, yes, it exists. This is this is for anybody on it? for the CBE. This yes. is specifically for the CBE. No, I know. Oh, okay. It's part there. Of the there covenants. was, and the under the original covenants, Ted Donnell was the uh, sole member of the Architectural Review Committee. He resigned that position. Who was it? Ted Donnell. Oh, oh gotcha. okay. He resigned that back in 11, 12, I think, maybe it was 14. No, it was longer ago than that. Yeah. We just took care of it with the legislation then. So because So it's of, just one person, you said? Uh, it, according to the covenants, it can be one person, yes. Okay. Okay. And, um, and again, because the, the there was a belief that the property would be developed more quickly than it was. And so there was never a reason for the constant, for an architectural review to be done because there was never anything to review. And, so, and I think so that the, this appointment is to comply with the conditions that exist within the covenants. Right. And I think the urgency is related to the Cresco facility, right? Because we, we have a zoning review pending. Council may choose to approach it a different way after this goes through if yes. I would say yes. so so the the urgency is to take care of the 
to take care of the zoning requirement that's out there now. And in response to what power? I mean, this is sort of review and recommend, or? Yeah, I mean, if you want to think of it functionally, it, it, the, the entity, we'll say in this case it would be Cresco, would come forward with their site plan, essentially. Uh, there would be some other information required, but it, it, in essence, what would the same information that would be presented to the Planning Commission. And uh, so uh, there's a logic by having the zoning administrator perform that function uh, because it will, I don't want to say it will streamline the process, although that might be the, the net effect, simply that person's qualified and has the expertise and the, and the, uh, the knowledge to, to perform the function of what the committee needs to have done. But what is that? What is the function? Well, it's set forth in, in the covenants. It's in the covenants, so it's well, my question is, does that one person have the power to say, oh, I don't like that design? Or is it just they make suggestions or they, they have standards by which it has to comply? The, 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 the covenants set forth standards, I believe, in section 4.1 of the covenants. And so that administrator looks to make sure the standards are com Correct. comply. I would say this, that the standards can't be just interpreted in an arbitrary and unreasonable okay. manner, particularly since it's village and public owned property. Just to clarify, because it seems like there might be some confusion, it doesn't eliminate the fullness of the process. The Architectural Review Committee precedes the BZA or the uh, planning, planning commission right. process so that individual assures that the correct information is then going to be presented to that body which is the intelligence of putting Denise in that position since she serves on both of those bodies she can assure the inform the correct information is going to those bodies for their final decision okay any other questions comments council citizens okay all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Okay, uh, now is the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. We ask what, that you come, excuse me, aren't you going to do uh, 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 staff reports? <laughs> I thought we did, I thought you said after citizens' concerns. No, no, no. she said after resolutions. Oh, after, oh jeez, okay. Legislation. So, staff together. reports, Patty. I am looking for the resolution. Yeah, yes. no, we just did. Like, <laughs> whoa, Chris. <laughs> uh, so, um, obviously, the permanent chief position has been announced. Um, the Gaunt Park pool is open. Pool passes are available only at the pool between 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. daily. Swimming for all passes must still be obtained through Ruth Ann Willick at the village offices during normal business hours. And um, there is a clarification in there about something that came up at a previous meeting. Um, a citizen noted that I had made a statement that had it not been for the hotel construction, the village would not have installed the infrastructure on Limestone Street in 2014. And while it is true that I did respond in that way when asked the question, would we have installed the in infrastructure if it were not for the hotel, um, it should also be noted that, number one, it was done for economic reasons to assist in the development of the hotel, and also that there were residents on Limestone who did benefit from the installation um, of the stormwater and the sanitary sewer, even though it was not initiated specifically for that purpose. So, um, at the, and at the end of the day, I believe the, the new roof drainage from the library was also um, put into that stormwater drain. So I just wanted to clarify um, what had been said earlier um, as to what the content of, of the discussion was. Okay, so. thank you. Um, Melissa. Okay, um, so there's a lot of stuff going on in finance and utilities. The utilities office, um, the clerks are being trained on the new utility billing software um, until Wednesday. Um, the company CMI came out and started today. I know that um, Nathalie, who is the, uh, the lead billing clerk, she's really excited about the capabilities. Um, it's just going to have a lot more reporting functionality for uh, citizens and um, businesses that we didn't have before and we're really excited about it. So we don't have a date that we will be going live with that yet. Um, we're still in the early stages of the conversion process, but they are training on that this week. 
Um, the auditors um, were here and uh, they have completed the bulk of their on-site work. They were pretty happy with everything so far, so um, we are hoping to have our audit released by the end of June for 2016. And um, in also attached to this report, there are two things. Um, the, the first that we'll discuss now and the second one later. Um, the first is the summer sewer ordinance. We had spoken about this at the last council meeting. There was supposed to be legislation, um, but we did not bring legislation tonight because we found a little bit of an interesting um, situation as it um, pertained to ordinances as they related to summer sewer. So I gave a history um, in my report and basically what happened was I was asking Judy if she could get me the word version of the original legislation that was passed in 2014 that um, currently makes up our summer, summer sewer adjustment program that we currently use. And when she was looking, she found an ordinance from 2011 that was never repealed or replaced. And that ordinance in 2011 was as a result of um, some research that council had tasked then village manager Mark Cundiff to do and he provided council with four options to address this exact same issue of what to do with water that isn't entering the sewer system and how do you rectify that with our customers and there uh, what happened was in June of 2011 ordinance 2011 was passed which requires sewer adjustment meters to be installed. So um, basically a customer who would like to have their sewer adjusted off of their bill would have that water metered and um, they would not pay for the sewer charges. Um, I know that we have a couple of larger scale users that have irrigation meters. This is very similar to that. Um, it's a very precise method of measuring water. Um, by metering it and therefore um, not charging the sewer. Our current method of doing this, which is um, an ordinance that was passed in 2014, which I've um, found some issues with that I wanted to try to co correct um, with the ordinance that I was going to bring tonight. Basically, it's purely estimation. We look at what's used in the summer, we purely compare it against what's used in the winter, and any difference is automatically adjusted off to those customers that apply. Um, so I was going to be bringing legislation that was going to essentially um, address some of the um, issues that I was having that needed uh, some clarification with that 2014 ordinance, and we found a 2011 ordinance. The 2011 ordinance was never codified, so um, if unless you knew that it was there, you wouldn't know it was there. And so just to to clarify that, um, passed but not codified. What does that mean exactly? Basically, if you look at our ordinances online, those are our codified ordinances, and that's the reference in which we all use on a daily basis to try to figure out, you know, what the regulations are within the village, what ordinances exist out there that help us do our jobs on a daily basis. Um, so this whole notion of what to do with water that doesn't enter the sewer system was talked about by council, a solution was selected, and um, the ordinance was created, but it was never integrated with our other ordinances that we have. Um, I think that it was, a, it was creating a section H of our ordinances, and then we found that there was a totally different section H which had to do with a really old bond for um, upgrading the wastewater treatment plant. So it was, it was purely an oversight. Okay, but since the 2014 piece was passed, I mean that would supersede that. It right? was creating a new section G. <clears throat> Oh, okay. So we have a G that addresses the issue one way, and we have an H that addresses it another way. So basically what I need from council is to determine which one of these you want to go with, because regardless, this will have to be fixed because one of them will have to be repealed, and the other one will have to be codified with whatever changes we would need to make. Well, my recollection is that, <coughs> is that the community was not happy with the 2011 um, ordinance because it, it was and, and I think I think it also I think it just it just 
was looked upon as being being difficult to implement, expensive, and um, um, more complicated than perhaps this issue needed to be, which is why um, I'm pretty sure, Judith, can you remember these conversations, these discussions? Vaguely. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure that that's why Laura came across, uh, that's why Laura came up with this alternative suggestion is because it was felt that the 2011 resolution was just not, it, it was overkill. And I understand from the finance director and from the, from our utility guys, why you're not, why that's what you want. Um, but I think it becomes a community discussion. Let's just say it's become more complicated now. For me, as a council member, it's not as simple as, as taking and, and kind of qualifying the, and changing and restricting the ordinance that we thought we had. It's, it's going to require a more complicated discussion. I don't know how you both feel about it, how you all feel about it, but... Well, I mean, on the face of it, I guess if, if people are going to try and say that they shouldn't have to pay the sewer tax because they're not using the sewer for gardening, then I'm okay with them having to put in... I mean, I don't know how expensive or how much work it is, but they're asking for something different from us, so I don't have a problem asking for something from them. How much would it be to install one of these meters? Uh, <clears throat> low end, probably $1,000. Oh. 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 Yeah, I mean, they're not going to pay that back. <laughs> You're adding another water meter. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that's strictly that, that. for garden use. Uh, At the time, there was an extremely <laughs> strong uh, will on the part of council to not in any way subsidize anything that would appear to be encouraging any kind of overuse of watering, even to the extent of watering one's lawn. That, that was the discussion that was taking place at the time. I, Clearly, the will of council can change, but that, that's how that was in 2011. Well, it was also certainly not to fill swimming pools, not to fill ponds, not to, not to fill hot tubs. It was for gardens, not, again, not lawns, but gardens. Um, it, and I think you know the, the proposal that you had had presented before of limiting it to a certain amount annually. Mm -hmm. um, that that seems to be where I would be comfortable yeah. going. I, you know, if we're if we're going to do it at all, I don't think we can do something that that requires a citizen to pay a thousand dollars. That it's going to take them years to to recoup that amount of money. I'm with you on that. If it were, if we want to put a cap on it, that makes sense to me. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think trying to keep it as simple as possible, maybe with that cap. And at the last meeting, you know, I had presented the changes that I wanted to make that would make the 2014 ordinance work, and just in simply trying to find the word format of that ordinance, it was discovered that there was this other one that was conflicting. So, have we had people who do extensive gardening? have come to us? I mean, do yeah. we have any people in this room who want to speak to this? Macy. Macy, do you want to speak to it? Oh, I don't use my, I use my ranger. Oh, does anyone? <laughs> well, Anna, what about Anna? Uh, uh, Macy Reynolds. We do use, uh, Dan Beverly takes that option because we fill the tank, the water tank for all the trees in town because there's, it's just the easiest thing to do rather than trying to use, I don't know whether you've ever tried some of the public places where well, I guess they're the village places where you can get water, but you have to use keys and they don't work right, and so it's just easier to fill it at Dan's house. So we do use a lot of water in the summertime that way, and we and he takes it off his water bill. Yeah, can can they can you use a fire hydrant or the firehouse? Yeah, yeah, we can, but hooking it up is more than any of us are really able to do. No, Johnny says no. No spread groundwater to Okay. Okay. If there is an easier way for that to happen, I mean, I would, I would, yeah, okay, that's an issue. Um, anybody else? I mean, I really didn't want to get into this. We've got a lot on the agenda, and this wasn't really intended to be a big agenda item. So let's let's just why don't we just put it onto the agenda? Yeah, we need to put it onto a future agenda. But but I I think Melissa, you're going to have to be thinking back the way we were thinking in the first place. Okay. Um, and, and you can hold, I know you've got something there on lodging tax, but you can hold that to the yes. next. Yes, so that's it for me. Okay. Um, Chief.
Good evening. So the police update um, on Wednesday, May 31st, the department participated in the Senior Center Flash Mob Dance. Uh, apparently, the interim police chief's dance moves that day were said to be transcendent. <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I, I'm happy I didn't step on anyone and I don't believe anyone was injured. <laughs> um, we had to cancel our second eight-hour session on de-escalation. Our trainer, uh, unfortunately, was in an auto accident. And he's, he's doing fine, but um, we did cancel that. The department is pleased to announce our newest dispatchers, Don Ward and Jillian Douglas, have both completed the required field training for the position of police dispatcher, and they're cut loose and on their own now. Both of them are very professional, and they've done this for a long time, but we do have uh, Don and Jillian that will be answering the phone. Um, I wanted to express, Brian had mentioned something that just went out today, and uh, I received an email from someone, and I just want to give you a quick synopsis, uh, not using any names or anything, but this person um, had an incident where they'd had too much to drink one night, and they retired to their vehicle only to fall asleep in the car with the lights on and a blinker turned on, and a concerned citizen called us, and the uh, person who ended up receiving a citation in mayor's court uh, for physical control because they were in the vehicle with the keys within reach. Um, again, sent to mayor's court. He was very gracious and sent the department a wonderful letter. And I want to quote part of it that states, I want to specifically thank Officer Beam and Officer England for keeping me and the community safe that night. I felt their professionalism went above and beyond what was required of them given the situation. And so that made me feel great because uh, we were very lucky to have Jeff Beam and Mariah England on the department and we've had similar situations before that hadn't turned out that way. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, happy to answer any questions you have. It's kind of a short report this week, but... Uh, Nothing much has happened with you. No, it's been pretty quiet. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks, no, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, you guys. Chief. So I appreciate this. Judy, Judy, Judy. All right, so this is a notation for the record uh, um, that there was an insubstantial error found in resolution 2017-25 after its passage on May 15th. Because the correction of the error doesn't affect any aspect of the legislation, it has been clerically corrected. The correction is to the first whereas and is as follows. Whereas the legislature of the state of Ohio approved the cultivation, processing, and dispensing of marijuana, etc. So the word legislature is replacing the word voters. That is the correction, and it can be clerically done. It has been clerically done, and now it's been noted for the record. Uh, Gaunt Park Pool is open, as you note, and it is completely awesome. Please do get your pool pass. That's about it. Thank you. Um, Moving on to um, I, I, oh, I, Patty has I apologize. I forgot to to impart some good news of my own. Uh, once I saw Brad's report in the packet, um, it reminded me um, we have had some really intense studying going on in our water and wastewater treatment departments. Um, Richard Stockton uh, has passed his wastewater two license. Uh, the licenses are one, two, and three. And R Richard has passed his wastewater two license with the highest score in the state. Wow. wow. Which awesome. is, is saying something because that is a very difficult test. It's a lot of math and a lot of chemistry, and that takes a lot of studying. And congratulations to Richard. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, Brad Alt, who is our uh, water treatment and wastewater treatment superintendent, has passed his water two license. Uh, so he now has a water class two license. And while he said, I didn't get the highest grade in the state, but I did pretty well. <laughs> so congratulations to Brad as well. Oh, that's great. Okay. I'm so confused on this agenda. I guess we do have citizens concerns now, so that's um, for any item that is not on the agenda. We ask that you come to the podium, three minutes, and state your name. Any 
Buddy here? Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, Chrissy and then Amy. Chrissy Cruz, and this kind of relates back to the medicinal marijuana facility. When I brought this up to council a couple of years back, one thing I talked about was that we set aside an acre of that land for a dog park. And I know that there was a lot of motion forward for a dog park in Yellow Springs some, some time ago, and nobody could find a good place for it. But I still would advocate that maybe we could get one of those committees together again and look at even maybe the village donating an acre of land for a dog park. Um, and then we could actually have what I actually dreamed for that property. We have the medical <laughs> marijuana facility. Puppies and pups. Hot plants and puppy dogs. I mean, I just can't imagine a better way to come into Yellow Springs. And I think there would be a lot of people that would be interested in working on that because I've heard so many people say that we really do need a dog park in Yellow Springs. And so I just wanted to bring that up. Can we start looking at that as well? Thanks, Chrissy. Amy? So much. I'm not actually sure if this is the place in the agenda, Marianne, since you brought it up earlier. But I wanted to just address the idea of um, the Village of Yellow Springs lending its support to the 211 mayors um, across the country who have come out um, following the president's um, withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreements to um, commit themselves in their cities and the citizens they represent to uphold the goals and the ideals of the Paris Climate Agreement. And so, okay. Yeah, we're, I think we'll, we'll talk about that briefly. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, on to, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Dorothy. It's okay, I know I'm invisible. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so Dorothy Bouquet, um, I know I brought it up to Brian and we talked about it with Susan. I was wondering if a council and the manager would be in favor of streaming those, can those council meetings on Facebook or on a free internet platform so that residents like me who don't have a subscription to a cable network could be able to watch it from the comfort of their home. <laughs> um, and I know that uh, Susan mentioned that uh, Channel 5 was, was um, heading that way, but in several years because of budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it would still really not apply to residents like me who don't have a subscription to a uh, cable network, you know, and if we think about affordability, it would be nice to see uh, those uh, council meetings being streamed online on a free platform. That's it. Thank Thanks, you. Dorothy. I think, I think somebody's maybe looking into it, but I mean, it's probably not that easy. I know you, without without you doing your play by play, I don't know what in a couple in a few weeks. <laughs> and um, Susan, right now, um, when do we usually have meetings on YouTube? How soon after? I try to get it on within forty-eight hours of the meeting. Okay. And uh, so we have a YouTube channel. It's called the. Um, community access. Community access Yellow Spring. Right. Um, and that can also be uh, accessed through yso.com, our website, where it says watch council meetings. Okay, anything else? Okay, moving on to old business. Um, I thought we could briefly, I don't really have much to talk about with this letter to the township and school board. It's not really a letter, it's um, just a proposal. I asked Judy to do a little bit of research as to the last time we all got together, and it was a long time ago. Um, and I spoke briefly with um, Lamar um, Spracklin, who's the president of the Township Trustees, and he was all for it. Just wanted to know, you know, what would be on the agenda. I have actually not had an opportunity to speak with Aida, who's the president of the school board, but I did talk with. Um, uh, Mario and he certainly thought that that uh, that everybody would be amenable. Um, I potential discussion items were down at the bottom, um, so I thought that um, I, you know I know that it had been kind of presented as a and discussed as and I think it actually made it into the paper discussed as a summit on affordability. Um, I'm not sure anybody's quite up for that. Um, it's that's that's a big undertaking. Um, so I would I, I guess I would I would support 
definitely support the meeting. I don't know that I would want it strictly about affordability. I think that um, that there are probably other things that we could talk about just to get up to speed with each other on things that are happening and um, uh, this, the projects and, and, and things that are going on in, with each entity. And then the community strengths and opportunities, clearly um, finances and affordability is, is within that particular um, discussion point. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I haven't drafted a letter. Um, I don't know that a letter is necessarily, you know, I probably would draft a letter with whatever discussion items. I think finding the meeting time is going to be a challenge um, to get that many people together. I even wonder if we should even try for the summer, if we should just wait till fall potentially. Waiting till the fall's fine with me. I think this was an idea I brought back right. way back in January um, in terms of goals. And the main thrust, and I do agree that it's a difficult one, is around the issue of affordability. To me, that's, it's a hard, uh, you know, in, in other states and other places, you know, schools are often under the same uh, body of decision-making body as, you know, other, the, you know, so they're, instead of having a separate school board, separate council, you know, a lot of times these, these uh, responsibilities are under one body. Um, and it's a little complicated, I can feel that, uh, for us to have that discussion, but I feel like it's something as elected officials that we have a responsibility to our community to get together and talk about. How we do it in a way that's productive, I'm not sure, so maybe thinking about in the fall, towards the fall, but I do think it is a key issue um, for our community and it's not going to go away. And if we don't address it, if we just sort of go do our own things as separate bodies, um, we're never going to, I think, meet the responsibilities we have to our citizens. So uh, I guess, you know, I don't know I, how to go but, forward. But I, do think I don't know that we should just, as uh, you know, the council, right. you know, maybe propose it. Maybe we need, you know, should have some private conversation and thinking about how to go forward with that, but uh, I do think we need, that that's where the, the discussion needs to be. Well, I, I, but the, the schools, in, in deference to the schools, the schools have proposed a plan for yes. what, what they're planning and, and they're working through the community, through community conversations. I think that they've, they've slowed that down a little bit, but they do have a, a, a timetable towards potentially putting a levy on the ballot in, in November, and um, I, this this is probably creating a difficult. And they're having this discussion. I mean, they're essentially being inundated with this discussion of affordability, and um, I, I think that I don't know. I guess I'm feeling like yeah. I don't know that it's our place to to suddenly jump on what their plans are. Um, and what their aspirations are for the school system. Um, that's kind of between um, them and the community, I feel. Uh, well, I agree with Judith. Uh, I thought that the main reason for this meeting was affordability. Uh, I th the other things that you have mentioned, ha the housing needs assessment, economic development, issues that we may not know about. I think all of those are important. I mean, I think it's critical that we are knowing what everybody is thinking of doing and to the degree possible co coordinate those things. And by listing affordability as a, an important issue doesn't, we're not targeting the schools. I mean, the village count, council, we're, we're involved in then, this too. Then why don't, I think maybe I'll ask Judith or Marianne to do the planning rather okay. than me. Okay. Shall we? <clears throat> sure. <laughs> so, uh, and one thing that I think we should talk about is um, how we can stay in communication. I, it, it is frustrating because I have brought up in the past, we have had an agenda item of meeting with the trustees and, and the school board. It never seems to happen. It, um, it, it, gets, it gets pushed aside and it's only when there seems to be a desire on the part of council to influence what the other bodies are doing that it seems to become important. So um, I, 
I'm more than willing to participate, but I'm not interested in planning it. Um, so let's move on to um, the CBE conversation. Uh, actually, let's do the Tree City. That was already on the agenda. We'll do the Tree City uh, designation update. Patty? Um, during a previous meeting, Council um, discussed the possibility of becoming a Tree City USA and asked for further information. I provided that. Um, we had a discussion at the last meeting, um, and Council asked me to submit an application to become a Tree City. I've not yet done that. It is on the list of the very long list of things on my desk to do, um, but I have been tied up with other things. Um, I believe that there were some folks who maybe wanted a little bit more discussion about it, and um, I think that's why we're revisiting it tonight. So I, I know that there are members of the tree committee here. Um, Anna, Macy, does somebody want to speak to this? I'm Anna Belisari, the president of the tree committee. Um, I didn't realize that you had already gone so far as to decide to apply, but I'm sure that you are then aware of the standards that are required for um, admission to the Tree City USA mm -hmm. program, of which I see two of them that might be some, take some work and some, be some, a little bit difficult. That first of all, we don't have a tree care ordinance, uh, a very right. well developed one here. And that's a big job to develop one of those. Although there are guidelines for that, and there's help for that, and uh, Wendy Van Buren I know would help, and, mm -hmm. and I know that the Tree City USA program does. And the other thing is that um, the, there has to be a community forestry program. We on the tree committee, we plant trees. We plant about 50 trees every year. Most of them are um, tribute trees, that people have requested us to plant in, to honor someone or to memorialize someone. Many of them are also replacement trees for trees that have been killed in one way or another. We've had all kinds of things killing trees in this town, including uh, uh, vehicular accidents and emerald ash borers and so forth and so on, mm -hmm. more damage to trees, et cetera. So, about a quarter of the trees we planted this year, we were counting as replacement trees, just simply to replace trees that we'd already planted once before. So we do need to have a little bit more attention paid to the care of trees after they're planted. We on the tree committee care for trees for three years after we plant them, but after that time, they are the responsibility of the mm -hmm. village administration, and I'm not sure that there's even a line in the budget for that kind of work, and it's not cheap. It, it, takes, um, it takes quite a bit of um, capital. Um, the Arbor Day observance we do ourselves, although it's a very small thing, but it should be enlarged to include the entire village. What we usually do is plant trees at the Mills Lawn School and have a little program for the students with the help of the Tecumseh Land Trust. So um, You've apparently already decided to do this, which is fine. I, I'd be curious to know what, you, what, what the value is for the village for doing this. And I'm sure the tree commission, tree committee, I'm sorry, the tree committee would be willing to cooperate and help with, with whatever you uh, plan to do. Um, but I'd like to know what is in, in it for you to do we, we didn't actually make a decision to, oh, to do this yet. That's what we're considering, okay. uh, correct? I, I well, a, I, I wasn't at a meeting. I, I, we were I was about instructed it. to go ahead and submit the application. I just haven't done it yet. Oh, oh okay. Um, um, and originally, I brought it because council had talked about it a little bit and asked me to bring the standards. And well, so. my understanding is it was a kind of a simple process of just. But but if it's more complicated, I'm thinking maybe we should hold out. But the reason that the whole thing came up was the energy board, I brought to the energy board yeah, the right. idea of having tree planting as part of what the energy board could work with the tree committee because it keeps things cooler to have more trees. Yeah. And, and you did talk to me about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and if we're gonna do it, and you said to me, you know, you gotta order the trees in the fall, 
and we wanted we were thinking about through the schools and maybe through other entities um, you know really becoming a yearly event of planting not just trees on the street but people could plant them in their yards you know provide shade for their homes that sort of thing um, so but you know this uh, being a you know tree city you know and meeting the standards it sounds kind of more complicated that I had understood and if it's more complicated I don't know that we should get stuck on that right now we might want to just decide because the village had talked about we would put a little money towards buying the trees and, you know we would put you know so and that then the energy board could do some educating about the cooling effects of trees and so when people think about cutting down trees around their homes I'll see these beautiful shade trees people take down yes. with just very thoughtlessly so part of it is so that people value the trees that they have yeah so, so it's that for public trees right so to expand it to so that was the direction trees. that we were that yeah. I think we were trying to go and um, yeah. So I don't think Brian, we should. I think this was yeah. your. Yeah, I think Brian brought up the idea forward. of the tree city. Yeah. Well, once, yeah, once we had this idea of potentially a goal of playing more trees, this was a program I was familiar with, and I have a question. Um, would there be a benefit to have um, a more formal relationship, especially with this passing off, uh, you know, after three years with the village? I mean, yes, it would very much be for the benefit of the trees and of the village. It certainly would be. A wonderful thing to have a better right because you know when I think about you know the way the structure could be it, it doesn't mean that the tree committee would change as much as right. you know more a more of a formal advisory relationship to the village so that we better understand how to plan things yes and we and, need and to, care for we, we need to plan better too because until recently we, we've been able to plant trees wherever we wanted to but now we've kind of saturated the village with trees mm -hmm. and we have to cope collaborate with Jason and 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 others regarding where we want to plant a tree so the better the more cooperation we have the better so that's what I see as a potential benefit is this then you know uh, kind of puts in place a policy where you know we're formalizing that relationship yeah. um, but, but I think it needs to be formalized I think they need to do it together sure. I don't think just applying and becoming a tree city first makes sense I think they, it, they need to work together to create what would be the best thing for us to do moving forward. If being a tree city is part of that, then we do that. But I think that they need to work together. Agreed. I, I mean, I, I feel like we've got an organization that's doing a, a good job. Yes, um, and and why, you know, why change that unless we need to make it better. We need to make it better, yes. support well, that, them and support the village. Right. I think that's what this is about. Right. Well, so. I think in, in order to apply, you kind of have to have these standards in place. Right. And so, they take a little bit of work to get right. those in place. So I guess, Patty, I mean, I, I'm not sure what well, you were planning I'm on doing kinda, with the application. If, again, I only brought this because council requested I bring it. It was not a personal goal of mine. I will say that I, I have several sample tree ordinances um, yeah. and also that right now we already spend more than two dollars per capita as far as the budget on the program because of all the tree trimming that we do. Yeah. Um, but does that really count as tree yes, care? Oh does. yes. Oh yes. But trees it's just need to be trimmed and the dead But it's trimming it's removed. not tri it's trimming so that they're not in the wires. It's not but, about but the we trees. also do other trimming. We do we do trimming of dead limbs, we take dead trees out. We just took unfortunately some very large but very hollow trees out yes. over on um Glen Street. Glen Street in front of my house. Yes. yes. Um mm -hmm. so we do plenty of other things besides that. Um Yeah. But trees require a lot more care and and trees that are planted in urban settings are not in their natural habitat and they require more care than typical forest trees. And they don't live as long, so they have to be replaced more often. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a big job. Well, well, I wonder if then maybe the next step, uh, you know, just uh, is this idea of thinking about planning for the spring to, do a, to, to start doing more tree planting and education around the energy it, uh, benefits of trees, all the benefits of trees. There's a lot of benefits, and um, I mean, so I don't know if the tree committee would, and if the village was willing to put, I don't know, think about. We haven't decided. Maybe five thousand dollars towards, you know, 
uh, ordering trees in the fall. If, I don't know, you know, maybe we, maybe you could give us a suggestion if we wanted to do this kind of thing. About that. Well, so maybe, about, yeah. How about if um, Anna and Melissa and I work together and try to sure. come up with a little bit more formal arrangement? Right. Sure. And then we'll go from there. That sounds good. That's good. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for offering to support more trees in your Well, yes. and we love the work yeah. that you guys do. Yes, thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Do you want to hear from anybody else? Does anybody else want to say anything? Please. I've got another tree committee member. Okay. Let's say a few <laughs> okay. My name is uh, Robert Gage. I'm a member of the tree committee. I, you know, I feel very strongly um, on this issue of remaining autonomous. We have for years now planted in excess of 2,000 trees in the village. I, I hear this issue brought up of planting more trees. Um, we're at this set point where our urban forest, our urban forest canopy is, makes everyone else jealous. We go to a tree commission academy with other, other, other towns and cities that are building a, a uh, tree city program, which has, has now floundered and gone away, you know, like Xenia. Um, close, close out to the McDonald's here, where the, the the tornado kind of prone area. They they have such a, a a limited forest cover there that it's it's really incumbent upon them to plant trees by the hundreds. We look for holes and spaces in the existing inventory that we generate and plant in holes and spaces where trees have failed or places where there is a legitimate hole here um, in a tree lawn somewhere. We have trouble placing trees in parks. Um, in part, you know, like Mills Lawn, we, we do the two trees a year at Mills Lawn. We keep open areas accessible in Ellis Park. Um, there's not, there, there isn't an abundance of space here. Um, it's simple uh, Google Earth search, you just look above the village and, and see the, the forest cover. It's absolutely substantial. And um, our group has worked well for such a long time now with relatively no money or no money at all from the village, mainly coming from, um, you know, donations and, and memorials for people that um, have lost someone. I've very personal experiences, wonderful experiences planting trees for people who have lost someone, um, placing items of significance underneath the tree, these things. Um, so I don't understand how making this jump makes us any better or more effective. I, I really think it doesn't. Um, I think that perhaps it gives a village a little bit more oversight on where we do our plantings, but these are all things that, that you know, after after Mr. Kennedy steps aside and, and Chris and I are working on the sites, we are using more map, more modern practices in siting trees and selecting species. So we are moving forward and trying to get better and trying to plant in areas that need the trees and, and, and staying off the areas that don't. So I, I really don't see the benefit. I think that we, we you know, we give away trees every day for Arbor Day. We, we satisfy, I think, at least two or three of the requirements for a tree city on our own. And we have for some time now. Um, the only thing that, that we don't, we occasionally ask the village to get out and um, do some pruning work and those things, which, which is, is hard and it doesn't fit within our um, budget. So yes, we can use help um, to help maintain this our urban canopy, but point blank is we're, we're planting, I planted 18 trees this spring, we're probably going to hit 20 trees in the fall, and I mean we are nearing or at capacity. I worry about meeting some of these goals set forth by the Tree City program, um, but mainly my main concern is I don't think that uh, we can do it any better than we have been. And um, I think the village is, is um, um, lucky to have this nonprofit uh, around. I think that we've done a bang up job for a long time here. And I don't see how uh, we can improve it much other than what we're doing actively now. I, I think we're asking for a meeting to talk about it and, and coming up with some ideas to move forward. I think we're supporting what you're saying. So Wonderful. thanks, Rob. Thank you. And I do just want to follow up because, you know, when I read the requirements, 
I don't, we're not thinking about a commission of council or anything like that. You know, they, the setup can be our parks department's in charge uh, from our end, you guys playing that advisory role and just making that relationship clear if it makes sense. But if you guys think it's a bad idea, then I don't I, think we'll. Yeah, I think we just need, rather than continue to talk about this, I think we just need staff and the tree committee to work together. I don't, I mean, we could keep talking yeah. in circles. We've got a lot of stuff on the agenda. I just want to add one little thing. Sorry. Just, it, you know, you're planning in public. Well, so the question, I have two questions for tree committee to consider when they, when you meet with Patty. One is planning uh, the past, the, um, the education that people, you know, like I say, maybe people are just cutting trees down so that need to be cut down, but sometimes you see trees come down that l look like they, you know, didn't need to come down, you know, and and I'm, and you're planting mostly in public settings, and I'm thinking more as shade for homes, you know, potentially, you know, not in public settings, and sort of assisting with that. So that's I just leave those questions to okay. you guys. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Um, the we'll move on to the CBE conversation, Brian. Uh, so yeah, I just want to, uh, at our last meeting, we talked about having a second CBE conversation on June 28th from 7 to 9 p.m. Um, and that was to focus on uh, fleshing out the covenants. I just wanted to make sure that we are moving forward with that because the Economic Sustainability Commission will be meeting on Wednesday. So, yep. I'm up here. Okay. Um, okay. Sure. Okay. So then, and and then we decided the location will be rooms A and B. So, June 28th is a Wednesday, 7 to 9 p.m. Rooms A and B, uh, and the focus is on understanding uh, the covenants and the restrictions that they uh, uh, put on the property. And I think that can also be an opportunity to expand on some of the data that uh, Melissa provided related to scenarios of what could happen in terms of how uh, it could economically benefit the village and address affordability. Okay. So, okay. Great. Um, Marianne, housing needs assessment update. Uh, yeah, we had a stakeholder meeting on Friday. Friday. Not Friday. Friday. No, because. Thursday. Thursday, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Last week sometime. Um, <clears throat> there were about 10 people there from the senior center and different organizations. And um, we got some interesting data uh, uh, about the village. Not real surprising, other than uh, I wasn't aware that 45% of the village population is 65 and older and 30 percent is 75 and older and by 2020 it's projected to be 60 percent 65 and older but um, other than that I mean we know that we're an aging community we found out that the housing needs that well that all kinds of housing are needing needed um, but the particular rain the the biggest uh, need is what I would say modest, modest, small homes and uh, apartments. So um, we had this meeting, and I'm just wanted to bring this back to council to say I think we're ready to one probably start developing an RFP, and two reaching out to the potential resources, whether they're financial resources mm -hmm. or resources of data. And I'm not exactly sure the timing or who should whether just to give this to staff and I tell them to go for it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> or what? <laughs> or I'd happy be happy to talk with you, Patty, uh, about sort of I mean didn't we get us. kind of a sample RFP from some folks? Uh from um uh, home Inc. I mean, I that, no, I no. thought we got a sample RFP from that consultant. He said he would provide one, but he didn't. Yeah. I don't think he provided it. Well, I think Emily has it, and she did. Okay. She sent it to me. Yes. So. So that would be. I mean, that seems to be a great place to start. I think. I mean, maybe what you're asking for. I, so it was a successful meeting. The community was. The people we talked to were very excited. We actually. I mean, there was a realtor yeah. there. Sheila mm -hmm. Dunphy was there. People were very excited about the information that's going to come out of this, and they think it's very important. And I've actually talked to the school board, and 
nobody was there, able to be there, but they're also very interested and supportive. So I think that there are some potential financial partners. I think probably what Marianne is looking for is just, you know, for council yes. to just affirm to continue to move forward. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. Go for it. Okay, thanks. Yes. Okay, we're on to new business. Uh, the item is lodging tax discussion. I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Brian Hausch, and recuse myself. Thank you. Okay, so this is uh, a discussion that we agreed last year that we would have um, relating to one of the few taxes that a municipality can um, assess, and that is a lodging tax. And um, I think, Melissa, you kind of took the lead on this, so maybe you could start with what you've learned so far. Yeah, um, unfortunately, tonight we're not going to have a lot of information in which to, to discuss. Um, Basically, what I had found, um, let me flip to the correct page here. Um, basically, what I've found was that there are a lot of nuances in regulations um, as they relate to a lodging tax. I had um, discovered that the county is able to implement their own lodging tax. The municipality um, in which the hotels and motels are located in are able to implement their own municipal lodging tax. Um, I had called over to uh, Greene County to the auditor's office um, since they are the distributor of the taxes. And they had um, sent me over to the commissioner's office and I had actually spoken to the lady that um, collects the tax on behalf of the county for lodging tax and she told me that she um, she has been collecting a 3% lodging tax for um, lodging establishments within the village and so I, I was actually unaware of that um, because I hadn't done a lot of research on this other than some preliminary stuff um, back a year ago in terms of numbers and um, estimations so since the county has their own 3% lodging tax, it kind of uh, creates a different set of regulations for us as a municipality. Um, so I'm trying to understand exactly what that means. And um, unfortunately, it's, it's taken a lot of collaboration. I've reached out to, um, I've reached out to, again, to the, uh, the individual at the commissioner's office who is going to have to talk to the prosecutor's office. I wasn't able to get any information back for tonight. Um, I've also reached out to OML because the ORC, as it pertains to lodging tax, where I've developed um, several questions as um, it relates to what it means for us since the county has their own tax. Um, they had, somebody had given me some information, but basically it was just a piece of information that said that it no longer applies to um, establishments with more than five rooms. Now it, um, it applies to all establishments, no matter how many rooms. And basically somebody from their legal team was going to be um, getting back with me that did have more information in terms of the lodging tax and what it means for us since the county does have one. So I know that that was a lot without saying anything. Um, but basically the county has one and I'm trying to determine what that means for us in moving forward and unfortunately I don't have those answers yet. Have you talked to other cities in Greene County that do? Well that? this is interesting because everybody else, there is some grandfathering that has occurred um, because most of the other municipalities have had hotels in existence for a very, very long time. Um, Cedarville is the only one um, that is smaller um, and that has had a hotel that has opened within the last, I think, maybe 10 years. It could be longer than that. Um, my memory is not that great in terms of when that actual establishment opened. Unfortunately, Cedarville does not have a um, organizational structure such as the Village of Yellow Springs, so it's it's been very difficult to try to talk to anybody from there. So um, I'm working on that as well. So everybody that I was able to talk to have had their um, have had their hotels for a very long time and they do have their own taxes. 
um, but like I said, I think that there's some grandfathering. If you look at the ORC as it relates to lodging tax, there's probably about 50 different dates referenced, and it's very legal. Um, so again, I reached out to OML to try to help us with our particular situation and what that means for us. Um, I mean, one thing that the, uh, some of the information that Melissa gathered shows that 77 of the 88 counties in Ohio do levy the county lodging tax. Um, each year it's increased with municipalities that have started to assess it. So currently there are um, about 50 villages. Um, I mean, we could get the exact numbers about that. Melissa, I'm curious, um, is the county collecting this tax on both above five rooms and below five rooms? Did they confirm that? Um, I have not confirmed that. Okay. Did I understand from your uh, memo uh, that the, is this something you, you do know for sure, is that the all together between the county and the municipality, it can't be greater than 6%? That's correct. The county is able to lodge three per, uh, or um, establish a three percent tax, which they have, and then the municipality can establish up to a three percent tax on its own. Okay. However, there are some stipulations um, because if the county has a tax and the municipality does not, it means one thing that I'm trying to <coughs> clarify. And if the county has a tax and then the municipality enacts their own tax, then that can mean some other things. Whereas we would not be collecting 100% of a 3% tax, it seems. So it's, it's, very, um, it's very interesting. Some of the things that I've kind of uncovered and what it means for us is just still very much up in the air. But yes, 6% um, total tax payable by the, or the customer um, at the establishment is what it equates to maximum. Except for a few special cases where larger municipalities mm -hmm. are building stadiums, but that would not apply to us. Um, what it does appear to say, though, is if we do not establish a tax um, for Yellow Springs, then the county is supposed to give us back some of that 3%. And so the way the law states it is they can give up to 1%, a, a third of their 3%. But that's one of the things we've got to figure out because they've never done that, even though the law requires it. And it says up to a third, but they have the discretion. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's the really the prosecutor gets involved right. to answer that question. Right. Uh, um, I, I would like to at least introduce the idea of widening this discussion. Um, we've talked about other sources of income uh, before, including the reciprocal tax, income tax, and looking at that. Um, oh, I forget what the other thing. Oh, uh, charging for events. Remember the staff did work mm -hmm. on that, and then that sort of slipped along. Um, and actually, as someone who has had a, a short-term stay place and, a, um, and does Airbnb, these taxes, I know, don't apply to us. But I would be happy, and I bet a lot of other people would be willing to do a voluntary tax. And I know that there are some retired people. We've been approached by a retired person, Judith and I, I think, or Karen and I, I guess, about someone who wants us to be charging retired people income tax, which we can't by per the state regulation. But we could do a donation kind of thing. So I'm just suggesting that we throw open this uh, ball of wax, worms, whatever, to look at the various income sources and sort of push this all together. And I guess I want to know staff and other council people are supportive of that. It's a fine idea, but we, as you can see by the meeting tonight, we've got so many things that we are working on uh, that, I mean, I think looking at this discrete, discrete question of, of the lodging tax should be the first step. And then, you know, I mean, and then in our free time to the future, we'll start looking at some of these other questions. But that, that would be my view. Okay, so I think yeah. we have several people that want to speak. Any yeah, other comments or questions from Council? Okay.
Uh, who would like to comment first? Okay. You say that this tax. And uh, will could be you could you state your name oh, just sorry. for the record? I, Becky Campbell. Um, you say that this tax would would be applied to anywhere from one person on up. Are you going to hit the people who are renting out their bedrooms? And the B and B's already established. I think up until now it's been five rooms and below. They don't have to do taxes. And Melissa can answer that. Yeah. It, it appears that there has been a change in law where it would it would affect establishments and I don't think now I don't know I don't remember off the top of my head what the date of this um, this change was if 2001 it was, it was so that was before the era of Airbnbs but um, I, I believe the way that I read it is it's just related to establishments so a bed and breakfast that would have two rooms would now be required to pay that tax, whereas in the past it was only rooms that were f uh, five and above. When did you say this change happened? 2001. Well, I, I when when I did the short-term stay place, which I stopped a couple years ago, I was paying tax. County tax? Ca no, not county tax. I was paying it to the state. Mm -hmm. But so. then, uh, then when I talked to the state, they said I didn't need to be paying it. Yeah. Um, so it I don't is think a small one place thing it's you it's the way you pass your lodging tax now so uh, the municipality and the county can make a choice is my understanding we need to clarify that but you can make a choice to stick with five or more rooms or to include it for all establishments and it applies to what they call transient guests so it would not be short-term rental um, but it could potentially apply to Airbnb Okay. Well, we all know that the, the target for this is a new hotel, uh, which I think is pretty sad uh, for you to, to, give, to attack them on this. I don't feel that they need a hotel tax. Jim's trying to keep his charges down so that he can have customers and customers that are satisfied with the hotel and uh, we give so much money away in this town I don't know why you want more and a hotel tax would be more thank you thanks Becky and, and I do just want to emphasize that this is something we promised that we would discuss and that's all we're doing at this point we're not we're not making any decisions okay um, Anyone else would like to speak? Jim? Jim Hammond with the Mills Park Hotel. Uh, this came up uh, about a year ago, and uh, the council decided to give the hotel about a year to get better established, the business portion of things. And uh, we're um, going to need a lot more time than that. It's There's a, a, a lot of challenges. There's a lot of unknowns. We have fluctuating, you know, um, occupancies. We, our costs are variable all over the place. Our, you know, the uh, property tax is about over twice estimated. The uh, utilities is close to twice and it's going up. So we have a lot of, a lot of challenges and what we need to do right now is focus uh, on raising our occupancy is how we address these challenges. So this, this tax, you know, a, an excise tax is a consumption tax. It's going to reduce consumption is what a tax usually does. So it's not going to help us raise our occupancy rates to, to meet our, uh, our goals. So I don't think it's going to be advantageous right now. I, I kind of propose we give us some more time to, we were a new business. We just started from scratch. We, we got a long way to go. Um, and a lot of unknowns still. We don't know the, the total overall economic impact of the hotel on the village. You know, we, we know the tax, some of the tax stuff and the payroll taxes and all that, but there's a lot more impact on the village that we, we should be able to measure at some point, you know, increase economic activity and that sort of thing. So 
Um, sounds like again, you guys got some questions, some unknowns yourself. So I think it'd be good to you know, give us some more time to uh, for us to get a, a handle on how things are. So okay. thanks, Jim. Lisa. My name is Lisa Goldberg. I'd like to echo some of what uh, Mr. Hammond just said. I believe that this village really needs to do more to bring new businesses to town and encourage them and support them. This hotel, if I'm not mistaken, employs approximately 60 employees, 55 employees. That's something that we've been looking for businesses to do to employ large numbers of people. Um, as most of us know that own businesses or have worked in businesses, it usually takes at least five years for a new business to become a strong, successful business. And I just think this is really the wrong time to be talking about a tax on a new business. In addition to that, um, as a side note, if something like this does happen, I do believe that a, a tax should be put in place for Airbnbs. Airbnbs don't pay any tax, whereas Mills Park is paying a multitude of taxes. So I would personally prefer seeing some kind of a tax and regulation code be put in place for all these Airbnbs that are popping up all over town. And that is, as we know, are taking away rentals. So that's that's my viewpoint. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, you folks don't know me, but my name is Stuart Zaharik. I'm from a nearby community called Cedarville. <laughs> um, I just want to take a few minutes to let you know that Mills Park is not a competitor. Mills Park is an ally. I also want to let you know that you have no louder cheerleader in Cedarville than Hearthstone Inn and Suites. Hop on your bike trail, go on up to Cedarville, get off and walk right into our lobby. I will be the first to tell you that I derive probably fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per year of revenue as a direct result of Yellow Springs. And we probably spend a lot of it at the brewery coming down back. But anyway. I just wanted to give a little preface, a little primer uh, on the hospitality industry. I, I'm not an expert, but like Jim, it started with an idea and it started with a whole lot of sacrifice. I know nothing about Jim's portfolio. I know nothing about his financial background or his business acumen. I don't know any of that, but I do know one thing, that when I look at that building, I see a lot of sweat, I see a lot of equity, and I see a lot of risk. Because before there was a hotel in Cedarville, we have Cedarville University, obviously, many thousands of students. But people would think, can you really build a hotel and make it fly? What happens when the students leave and go home? So I did my due diligence. Oh, by the way, I have 18 years of higher educational administration before I got into hospitality. At a certain point, I thought, well, it's time to move on. I did my diligence, and I saw several things. I saw number one, it's a vibrant community, but we have Yellow Springs. Yellow Springs is a brand. Yellow Springs is, is a commodity. Uh, and Yellow Springs, you know, um, can sustain itself through tourism. Not so much Cedarville. So tourism is not something that we built Hearthstone and Suites to support, although we would love to have it. Matter of fact, if you know anything about Cedarville, the average business probably spends 25, 36 months and it's gone. There's not a whole lot of sustainability in, in commerce in Cedarville. It's such a small town, not much parking, but it's different here. So we had Yellow Springs, I had Cedarville University, then this new thing. They all of a sudden started taking up these, these uh, railroad ties right around 1995 and 96. And they talked about this bike trail coming in. All of a sudden, there's a bike trail. Now, at any one point in time, I can look back on 15, 16 years of experience and say Yellow Springs is probably 10 to 15% of my business. The bike trail is probably about 10% of my business, and it's seasonal. Cedarville University is probably about 50 to 55% of my business. 
And just like Jim will experience if he has it already, it's really tough between December and February in Groudhog Day. All that being said, I have about 15 years worth of experience in cash flow, understanding the risk, and knowing what the, or most of the pitfalls are. No one told me that when I hired someone at, let's say, $8 an hour, I really was paying out of pocket $12 an hour, or you know, 11, 12, because there were other benefits that had to come. Social security and all those other things had to go along with it. No one told me that. Uh, no one told me that I would be paying property tax on my building as though I lived in a million dollar house. Nobody told me that. A little sidebar here. If you all read the newspaper, you know Jim's property costs a little more than $1 million. And if you look at your own house assessment and taxes, you know it's tied to the value of your house. Therefore, if his hotel costs four times more or more than mine to build 15 years ago, he's probably paying four times more in property taxes out of his revenue stream. And that's money that comes directly out of the revenue that flows through Mills Park. Another thing, the national, the national standard or average of occupancy is somewhere between 60 and 63 percent. And we also live in a world where we have Hotels.com, Expedia, Booking.com, Orbitz, and all the other televised commercials that you see. All these are called online travel advisors or agents, OTAs. The OTAs control the lion's share of the market, and an OTA picks up between 20 and 30 percent of the revenue of any hotel. Hotels then have to artificially inflate their prices, and then they also have to advertise on television. Neither Jim nor I have the benefit of going on TV. We don't have any roaming gnomes, we don't have any sea captains, we don't have any fancy commercials or Star Trek representatives going on television to support us. All we have is our good name and what we offer. So all that being said, when you are a national franchise, you have brand recognition. But when you're Mills Park or Hearthstone and Suites, you're who? You're what? Because we're not a franchise hotel or motel, we're not in the Walmart game of pulling in numbers like off the expressway where you're pulling in 80%, 90% occupancy and just running people through. Jim has built the building that I wish I could have built, but I couldn't. Well, because we didn't have enough property, first of all, and I didn't have the resources to do that. But to see a building like this structure with Amish furniture and all the ambiance that he has, this is an amazing thing. Now, when you start a, a hotel for the first time, you have an influx of curiosity seekers that want to stay there. That happened to us. And as, you, as time goes by, they become regular loyal customers. Now for us, because we have Cedarville University, these are families coming in with students. And it's constantly changing year after year after year. They might be a little bit different in terms of a dynamic here in Yellow Springs, where we have a wonderful hotel catering to a certain segment. His costs are higher, his prices are higher, because he has to get back some of that money that he put out. So with that, I would expect him, Jim, to take probably anywhere between five and seven years before he can get stabilized because we don't have a Cedarville University here. Antioch has opened and closed five or so times in its history and it's just now getting its breath back and I understand that um, Antioch uh, Midwest is possibly relocating and there might be a market segment being lost there. There's a lot of dynamics going on with the economy, the aging of a population, and as the boomers get older and there are less dollars because of whatever happens in Social Security in the next few years, there's some unknowns out there. And what Jim is trying to do is maintain his position in an industry which is now really posed, uh, poised against the independents because we don't have the franchise power. We now have the Airbnbs coming in. We, we have supported the B&Bs in Cedarville, in, uh, in Yellow Springs for years. How, however, before Jim even built his hotel, I must have been spending um, half of my time, ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year, sending to Springfield. Ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year, sending to Jeffersonville, to which people would say, "Where?" But I'd send them there. Because Stuart, I'm sorry. We have a three-minute time okay. limit, and we've kind of gone beyond that. Said, so if you can, I'm, I'm an avid supporter of Mills Park. 
Um, I am available. If you have any questions you wanted to ask me, call me at Hearthstone and Suites, Stuart Zaharik, 766-3000. I'll be happy to sit down in your office. Just, just take me out to the brewery and let's talk. Um, but, but Jim is, has done a, a, amazing work there, and we are his partner in the industry. I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Oh, sorry, Paul. You're next. <laughs> sorry, Paul. <clears throat> Kurt Butler, lifelong resident in Yellow Springs. Excuse me for having to use a wrinkled up note out of my pocket, but I want to try to keep within this three minutes. So I want to start by just going back, all the way back to when, uh, when we made the agreement with a DMS uh, and awarded them a tax abatement. I applaud you for the work that it took to bring that business to town, and I'm thrilled to death to have them here. Um, so the 300000 that we are abating over the next 10 years, I think, is a, you know, is a small price to pay for having a business like that in the community. So my question is, comes to why, when the Mills Park Hotel requested a little bit of tax assistance and abatement uh, on the front end of things to, until they could get their feet firmly planted and established, did we deny that? So that's one question that I have for council. Um, you know, when we brought them in, um, they committed to bringing, you know, their company to Yellow Springs. And with that, they brought all of their own employees with them. Along with that, they committed to a, a hiring new employees within a specified period of time. And I think it, initially that was 16, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably exceeded that. Um, but in a situation like this, we've got a, a longtime member, lifelong member of Yellow Springs that's committed private funds to building an incredible hotel in Yellow Springs um, and has produced 55 new jobs to Yellow Springs, has paid $116,000 in property taxes and its utilities are a 50K plus. Um, you know, and I would encourage council to embrace the hotel and perhaps show a little bit more support for the hotel. Um, from my perspective, um, it's been, a, the love has been a little tough to come by. Um, I don't know if I've exceeded my, my time frame, but back in 2014, Yellow Springs News reported uh, that Jim had made it perfectly clear that he was willing to stop construction on the hotel if we move forward with this, with this increase in taxes. Um, and yet here we are again talking about it again. Um, I just think that it reeks of a quick money grab and that, um, uh, like, um, <laughs> excuse me, Marianne, I, always, I wanted to call you Marianne, but Marianne um, had alluded to, to pursuing some other possible increases in our, in our income rather than um, hammering a new business trying to get established in Yellow Springs with this additional tax. Thank you. Thanks. Paul? See, I'm not used to looking over there because, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, Paul, been here about 50 years. Um, pretty much Curtis just said what I was going to say. We brought DMS from Dayton, an out-of-town company, that gave them a good deal. They were strangers, but you gave them a good deal. And my understanding is they want to keep getting a good deal. Jim is not just a new guy in town. He's several generations going back in this town. He brought his own money. He didn't come to the village and say, I want two or three million. He put millions of his own money into taking a property that sat there for the last 15 or 20 years with a dump house that wasn't even good enough for anybody to rehab. It ended up getting burned down because anybody looked at it, it was junk. Most of the trees were already infected with borer, so all those nice trees people yelled about, he didn't even throw those away. He took them, had them milled up, kiln dried, and we built stuff in the place. Disclosure, I made money. I built the 16 tables in there. <laughs> but on top of that, he has produced, as they say, 55 employees, as well as sales tax. He's increased the property tax tenfold. We weren't getting any hundreds of thousands a year off that property <laughs> on that old junk house. So that helps the school. And personally, I've had at least three of his clients look me up and spend thousands on my furniture 
and have it shipped to California and other states. One, an Air Force colonel who was in Wall Street after the Air Force and in the hotel industry loves his place and regularly calls me. He'll be back here. He's talking about coming back and buying everything in my showroom and putting it in a truck and taking it to California. So that's just from one person who stayed in his house for two days. That's how impressed he was with the quality of what he built in the middle of our town, regardless if it looks like a white mansion, blah, 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 blah. I've heard all the hate about it. But the reality is all he did was pour his whole soul and his family's soul into the history of his town, going back to his grandpa or great-grandpa, founding Hammond Dry right, right down on Dayton Street. So he and a stranger from Dayton called DMS. He's one of us. And I, I say give him five years. That's what I've been saying since the beginning. If you can give DMS years of tax abatement that's not getting the school anything off property taxes, he could get a five-year abatement, let him get up and running, then come hit him with a sales tax. Right? Because the tax isn't on him. His, the tax is on the guy that's coming from California to stay, who's rich enough not to care, by the way. But even he said, no, give that guy five years. He said, I was in New York, Trump kind of stuff. He goes, that kind of can kill you in the competitive world. So that's all. All right. Thanks, Paul. Any other comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Susan Butler. I'm a 34-year resident of Yellow Springs. Started working at the mill with Jim. Saw how good and this blood sweat that he put into that. Asked me a long time ago if I'd help him run a eight-room B&B. Was going to just rehab an old house. And then thought, well, I could bring jobs. I could bring business to town. I could help support all the other businesses in town. So it went from eight rooms to 12 rooms to 28 rooms. It has done nothing but bring business to all the other small businesses in town. He has brought 55 jobs. He's given me a job. I love working there. I couldn't ask for a better boss, a better family to work for. And I hope that you guys take that into consideration. Come support us. Uh, there's a lot of faces here I've never seen there. We are part of Yellow Springs. We all live here, and we all pay our taxes. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Any other comments? Yes. Okay. My name is Marco Williams. I'm from the mill. So I guess my whole thing is we do, you guys talk about a lot of seniors and stuff in this community. Well, we do a lot of, um, like we take a lot of customers from that here. So our market is pretty much baby boomers, senior citizens. So, you know, they're on fixed incomes, things like that. So they don't really have, they're pretty peculiar about what the prices are. <coughs> Um, as a whole, we get that talk all the time when making reservations, how much is the total, you know, we want to know what the final is. So if you keep adding taxes, it kind of it persuades them to do go other places that offer different entitlements. For instance, we're not as big as like the Hilton's, Merritt's, IHG, so we don't offer those programs. Well, we offer something more. We offer this community that doesn't have to be like everybody else. So. In the words, we don't have to keep adding taxes to make to bring value um, to the hotel. So I mean, to the community. So I guess my whole thing is like when we're <laughs> the hotel. Um, I mean. Like Jim's, you guys, like Jim's like one of your own, and like I don't understand why you do this to one of your own in the community. Like there's other communities that I don't understand. They would take this hotel and put it in their property if they could lift it off the foundation. But it's like you guys, I just hope that you guys do away with the um, tax because it just, it doesn't make sense because you, you know, the Hammonds are one of your own people, I mean, just to help them. Um, I mean, that's, I mean, <clears throat> that's the wish, I mean, I guess from this is just, you know, people are, um, you know, the Hammonds are good people, so if we can just kind of not tax, you know, making money off of just 
you know, because you can. You know, we just need to build value to the community, take care of the community, and in that, take care of our own. So that's it's clear that you care deeply about this and also about the Hammond family. Thank you. Thanks. Monica Lindsay, also with the Mills Park Hotel. As I'm you can sorry, see, can this you is there. One more time. So my name is Monica Lindsay, and Thank I'm you. also with the Mills Park Hotel. As you can see, this is very emotional for us all. Uh, we spend a lot of time at the hotel. We spent Marco started before I did. I've been there right before we opened. So I don't know the family. I'm imported from Germany. I'm a new citizen to the United States. I've been here about three years. I don't know nothing about the history. I came to Yellow Springs. Um, my father-in-law brought me here, and I fell in love with the, with the town right away. And um, I was able to get the job at the hotel, and I was so proud. It was, I get to work in Yellow Springs. I get to work at this new hotel. And spending a lot of time there and getting to know the owners, um, Jim is hardworking, Ms. Libby is always out um, donating money, helping other people, helping good causes. Katie always works really hard in the kitchen. Just the whole dynamic of what they're trying to do for the town. You're always here, let's do this, it's good for the town. Let's do this, it's going to help people. So they are looking out for the town and for the benefit of what they can do. And I really look up for that. I think that is a wonderful thing to do. And we work really hard, tirelessly at the hotel. Um, 12, 14 hour shifts sometimes. We put in 60, 70 hours. Susie's always along with us. Um, so it becomes emotional because we get to experience the wonderful guests that we have. We get to experience the wonderful stories people tell us. We make, you know, we get to experience um, the good and the bad. There's been bad, there's been growing pains, everybody goes through. But we also know we're nowhere near being able to carry more tax. It's gonna, it's gonna suffocate the business. So also from my end, for the 55 people that work there and for all the guests that get to experience Yellow Springs. And we're advocates to Yellow Springs. We go to Columbus, we attend bridal shows, we try to bring business to Yellow Springs. We try to bring groups to Yellow Springs to help to bring money into the town. We don't go and sell the hotel. Where's the hotel at? If it's outside of Yellow Springs, if the hotel wasn't Xenia, we are advocates for Yellow Springs and we love doing that. So that's also on my end. Just give Mr. Jim and the family and everybody at the hotel a break so we can be there 10, 20, 50 years from now and still do, maybe I won't be there anymore, but we still want to be able to provide a good service and keep the standards up. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Any other comments? Okay, Patty, can we answer the question um, that I guess Kurt raised, which um, about the tax abatement, the DMS tax abatement. Yeah, and then I guess also um, why Mills Park didn't uh, was denied tax abatement. I honestly cannot answer the second question because I wasn't here during the discussions and uh, didn't realize that they did not. Yeah, I think we'd have to go back, uh, Judy would have to go back through some council meetings and so forth to okay. so bring that back. Right. So I think that's the only outstanding question. Um, but maybe, do you want to clarify what the DMS tax uh, abatement the is? The DMS tax abatement is on new construction only. It is not on the existing buildings as they stand today. It is only on any new construction. Um, that um, which is what we gave the extension for recently um, and it will I believe it's a 10-year tax abatement okay um, Judith did you I'm sorry yes please. Uh, sure uh, but maybe uh, quick less than a minute. okay so making note of what Patty just said the entire Mills Park Hotel is new construction I mean let's not forget that this hotel was built from the ground up. It's also new construction, and they weren't given any tax abatements. So again, let's support them, not hurt them at this point. Thank you. 
Uh, okay. Um, any other questions or comments from council? Um, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, well, I want I want to meet with Jim. We we haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, but I guess I want to just say this is a lodging tax dis discussion, and I I hate to be see it be seen as we're hostile to the, the hotel. We're not hostile to the hotel. It's been a wonderful, ass, you know, new asset to the village, and I think everybody in the village recognizes that. Uh, the village is struggling around, you know, how to pay for uh, the the services that we provide, so we need to be looking at this. It's not just going to affect the, this hotel. It would affect all uh, lodging establishments, I, I assume. And um, it seems to me like we need more information, but I hate to see it set up as, you know, we're hostile to the Hammonds or we're hostile to this, this you know, beautiful hotel. That's not, that's not uh, the case. And obviously we want the, the, the hotel to be successful. So. Um, trying to, you know, we're just trying to look at how do we pay for, you know, there are people having to leave the village because they cannot afford the taxes here and the utilities and so on. We're having, we have a problem. So, you know, we're trying to address that. So I just want to reset what this discussion's about. Thanks, Judith. Jared? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to say is, you know, I'm looking at this as an information gathering session as we did last, the last time. And we all know that this council doesn't act hastily unless it's an absolute emergency. Uh, I'm, I appreciate the folks that have spoken and our staff does and has been trying to get us additional information on the whole tax issue. And uh, for myself, I will want to get all the facts in before I ask council to take a uh, take a vote on this issue. And uh, and again, it's I think the community as a whole appreciates what the Hammonds have done. All the comments that I've heard have been uh, good about the hotel, the service, and so forth. And of course, I want to look down from heaven in 20 years and see that the hotel is still surviving and so forth. But uh, as a council member, we always have to look at what's going to benefit the community as a whole. That's why we were elected and so forth. But uh, be patient. I haven't put the hammer down on the year so no vote yet so more information to come thank you great Marianne no, good don't. okay so uh, yes uh, I want to emphasize this was an initial discussion we promised to have this discussion um, I mean again it, it's important for us to hear as Jerry said um, some of uh, some of the uh, issues that could relate to um, the competitiveness of the hotel. Um, I think there's no question about what a beautiful structure it is and um, how great it is to have it uh, in the village for economic development as a whole, which is something that Patty talked about. I like Paul's examples, and I would hope that every shop downtown uh, has an example where, or many examples where they benefited from uh, folks that have visited and stayed at Mills Park Hotel. So I think that's without question. So, you know, for us, establishing more understanding of the impacts that this tax can have, even though it's passed on to the consumer, that's very important. And as Jerry said, uh, I mean, we're just trying to understand the issues. Um, so thank you to everyone that spoke tonight, and uh, we will certainly be letting you know when this is next on the agenda. Um, but we're not rushing uh, a decision on this. I was going to say, do we know? Are we going to have the information for the next meeting? Is there? What do you think, I'm, Melissa? I'm waiting on information from OML in terms of interpreting the ORC as it relates to us, and I was also waiting on information from the Greene County Prosecutor. So um, the ball's kind of in those organizations' courts. So I, I didn't have a date promised. I told them that I would really like to have the information for tonight when I reached out to them at the beginning of last week, and I didn't get it. So. Melissa, okay. uh, are you also looking for information regarding 
the county tax that's already in existence? And that's the that's that's the bulk of my question right, right now. All right. Well, let's plan on having a follow up discussion on the 19th, and we'll uh, you know so. Of course, the public's always invited and will report back on whatever we have confirmed. I was going to say, uh, if we can't get the information by then, we should hold, we should hold the discussion because obviously mm -hmm. we can't have a complete conversation yeah. about it if we don't have all the information. Well, we should have some updates. Yeah. This, yeah. Should okay. We, should we get Karen back in? Yes, we should. Right. Remember, we said we're going to have a discussion in two weeks. Thank you. Um, we added a couple of additional items to the new business. Um, uh, the Paris Accord support, Marianne, um, you wanted to address that? Yes. Um, we received um, a letter from uh, Laura Skidmore uh, of the Mothers Out Front in Yellow Springs which is a grassroots group of mothers, grandmothers, and other caregivers who are concerned about climate change. And they were making a request that uh, Yellow Springs pass a resolution uh, similar to what uh, mayors and other cities around the country are doing in reaction to our presidents uh, pulling the United States uh, out of the Paris Climate Accord. So um, I have read this resolution that uh, was submitted and to me it's a no-brainer for us to do this. Uh, the main thing is that we say that uh, we will uh, develop a climate action plan. We're already doing that. Already looking for other ways of uh, lowering our carbon footprint and to be able to be in alliance with other uh, communities around the country and other all the other countries around the world except Nicaragua and Syria, I think. Um, so this is something we can States. bring to the next yes, meeting? Yes, yes. Okay. So I, I'm going to request that uh, Judy take that resolution and if Judy, if you see any things that you think should be tweaked, I'm happy to work with you on that and bring it back for the next meeting. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then Brian, Complete Streets Workshop. So quickly, um, we had a meeting this morning, and uh, the plan is to have a half-day workshop for council, staff, and uh, the Active Transportation Committee. Uh, since that will be a public meeting, other, others could come as well. Um, then to have a community engagement um, uh, forum to talk about complete streets, and then to follow that up by a working session, uh, assuming that we're gonna continue to move forward um, to uh, craft a policy that could be recommended to council. Okay. to consider. Um, so Judy, what I was thinking is maybe you could coordinate finding a date that would mm -hmm. work for people rather than take time now to discuss that. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Um, on, we've done our report, so we're on to future agenda items. Um, we have a resolution um, regarding the tax budget for 2018 coming from the finance director. Um, OPWC grant for stormwater mitigation. I'm sure we'll learn more about that. Um, so are we doing the resolution for the adopting guidelines for, for policing? That's okay. We'll, um, fiber advisory board report. Are they ready? Are they going to be they, ready? I do not believe we're going to be ready. No, that should probably be moved down to um, July. Okay. Um, home Inc. presentation. So I think Emily is coming to present on the Cemetery Street project completion. Um, we've had the HRC annual report added. We've had a resolution on the Paris Accord added. And um, we actually added before an executive session for the purpose of the review of the public official to review Patty. Um, we're going to continue the discussion about the lodging tax on the 19th. And okay. I don't know if the police um, guidelines will be ready. We haven't. Yeah. We, we are so, still communicating with the okay, so 365. Let's, so okay, so let's I take that off. No. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, and then you had a potential ordinance for authorizing the sale of land if the licenses were obtained. Okay. Um, 
we'll know later. Yeah, let's leave okay. it. Let's not put it on. But we, okay. we will we'll note that that's that that's a possibility. And then the summer sewer ordinance dis oh, um, or discussion. Oh, um, discussion. No, I think we need to continue it as a discussion. discussion. Okay. Then we had the swearing in of uh, oh, yes. Chief Carlson and also the HRC report. Yeah, I already had that. And we'll also have, um, uh, if we want to remind our, our commission uh, folks to get the minutes in, we'll also have our, all of our commission reports. Yep. Okay, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you all. Aye. Judy. Aye.